All right. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Today is day three of Lean Six Sigma Green Belt Training. Again, I'm Cedro Toro. I'm Ryan Beacom. And today we're going to dive into the measure phase of the five-step DMAIC process of Lean Six Sigma. Now that we've defined it, we're all going to understand how do we measure what's going on. So that's going to be the topic today. Yes. But before we get there, we have to go back and revisit what we learned in the first two classes, which comprise the yellow belt training. And what we want you guys to learn is how to select good projects so that you can have a good project for your green belt project, but also so you can select good projects going forward and continually do projects and Kaizen events for you know, the rest of your career. In fact, the, the main topic today is really gonna help that because we're gonna dive into uh, Pareto charts and really understanding what it means to surface the problems and see which ones are the biggest ones. So we're gonna deep dive into that. And that's gonna be a big tool to be able to help you identify problems moving forward. Yeah, exactly. The measure phase is great because the measure phase helps us surface problems. And all of those problems uh, we call opportunities. They're opportunities for future projects and ways to improve. And we're going to dive in how to, how to find those uh, problems today and then turn those into Kaizen events. So uh, recap a little bit of what we've learned so far and where we are in the agenda. So Yellow Belt session one, we did an introduction to lean, which we talked about the three main elements of lean, which if you guys can remember are the eight ways, eliminating variation and eliminating overburdening. So that was the key there. And then the next thing we talked about was introduction to Six Sigma. And Six Sigma is all about solving problems using a data-driven approach. So those are the key elements that we took away from the first day of training. On the second day of training, we started talking about project selection and defining what our problem was. So we moved into the define phase of the Six Sigma process for DMAIC. And we gave you some examples of different ways that you can do projects. There's, there's lots of different projects out there. Tons. A, a good project could, for example, be eliminating uh, wasted time during changeover. Yeah, absolutely. Another one could be just 5 Sing, just going through and making sure that everything is, is where it needs to be so that you can execute the work, which eliminates uh, you know, the, a, a number of wastes in and of itself. Yes, and for those of you who don't know what 5S is yet, I imagine many of you do, but workplace organization is what Ryan's talking about. Yeah. Another great project could be uh, mistake proofing. So going out with your team and finding a quality defect that you, you are dealing with on a constant basis and finding a way to get rid of that defect. So yeah. and a, another great one could be finding the variability in your process. You're trying to fill up a bag with so much weight and it keeps going off, thereby everyone downstream is having problems because the backs aren't quite the right weight. It's, you know, these are just the endless number of ways that you can approach a Greenbelt project. The key is really understanding what the problem is. And instead of just jumping to the solution, which what we're really key to do, we all think that we're, you know, here at the workplace and we need to get to that darn solution. We're trying to help you really so we can define the problem, measure it and analyze it before we get into the solutions. Yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna slow down. We're going to identify all of the opportunities that we have. And then we're going to go through that structured five-step approach to solving all of our problems. And the thing we'll learn today is that, that that structured approach doesn't have to take a lot of time, right? You can do a full DMAIC project in a few hours. Yep. You know, and the examples we gave about 5S projects, mistake-proofing projects, changeover projects, those are some of our favorite because we can do those in a couple of hours. Very quick. If we want to improve throughput, for example, uh, Ryan and I have both done projects where within just a couple of days, we've been able to take a company's throughput from, a, you know, 100 units an hour to 1,000 units an hour, literally, you know, 10x in, increase in throughput. So those are great projects, too. And every project's going to be different. Some are going to take longer. Some are going to be shorter. Um, what we're hoping is for your Greenbelt project, you're going to find a project where you can use as many of the tools that we're teaching uh, in these sessions uh, so you can practice them. Now, you may choose a very small project that you get done in a few hours or days. If so, we'll have to maybe piggyback with another project right after that so you can practice more of the tools. We want to give you, during your Greenbelt training, a lot of experience to a lot of different types of projects and different tools and methodologies to solve those problems in those unique scenarios. Um, and, and not every Greenbelt project is going to cover all the things that we teach. So in those cases, you're just going to have to take the tools that we are teaching you and you're going to have to practice them using hypothetical scenarios so that you uh, can learn them and then uh, pass them off on your green belt exam. Which is what we're going to do today and the, and the subsequent days to help you really, you know, everything is about application. We're not trying to talk about this in a 
theoretical construct. We're trying to talk about this in, in, in a way to really apply so that we give you tools that you can go out and try. But just like Sator said, don't get caught on the fact that not every, not every project is going to require every single thing that we talk about, um, but we do want to enable you to use those. So you can use them at the appropriate time. I feel like we're trying, what we're trying to say right now is we're gently letting them know that we're about to throw the kitchen sink at them. And yeah, everything with that's it. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, it does just, feel like the kitchen sink sometimes. Yeah, so you know we're about to go through a lot of stuff, and that's okay. Take notes, learn it, and uh, hopefully some of it you know already. Okay, so there are three things you have to do to get your certification. Number one, you're going to have to finish this training. That's easy, right? We have the recordings. If you can't make it to a session, you can watch it anytime online through our portal at UMA. Number two, you're going to have to complete a project. So you're going to have to make some sort of process improvement to something that is part of your job. Whatever the scope of your job is, whether you're an operator on the production line, a materials person, a maintenance person, a front office person working in human resources or marketing or sales or you know, customer management, whatever your world is, we're going to find a way to improve that process. And that's going make, to be your project. Yeah, make something better. That's it. That's what this is all about, just making something better. And then the third thing you're going to have to do is pass the green belt exam, which we are going to do on the last session of class. So you hear, you see on the slide here, session eight, green belt exam, right? So the last session of this class will be Ryan and I going through with you all the questions on the exam, and we're going to use it more as a review. So if you hate tests, don't stress. We'll go through it together and we'll we'll answer all the questions, hopefully in a way that you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And, and you get a, a confirmation that you understand uh, what, what you learned. I'm stressed already. You said test. It's, yeah, we need a better word for tests in this country. <laughs> okay, so today is session three. We're going to get all the way through the measure phase as best we can. And then session four, we're going to go through the analyze phase. That's going to take up two sessions because in the analyze phase is where we learned a lot of the data driven tools of Six Sigma and the statistical analysis tools. So um, if you haven't done math for a while, we're going to do some math. If you hated math in junior high and you swore you'd never do it again, don't worry. We have software that's going to do all the math for us. All you need to know is how to understand what the software is telling you. So that's great. Um, and then I wish I had that in school. Yeah, we probably did. We just didn't know. Well, well, nobody told us. Session six, we're going to go through the improve phase. And then session seven moves us finally to the control phase of the DMAIC, which gives us session eight to do the exam and get ready for our project report outs. So that's where we're at this week. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Let's dive right in. And before we get there, Let's talk about your projects and what sorts of things you selected. So let's get your fingers ready on the, on the chat window there. Uh, or if you wanna unmute and talk to us, we can have you unmute and talk as well. But go ahead and type in the chat window um, some of the ideas for projects that you guys came up with since the last session or during the last session when we were going through the define phase. What were some problems that you identified? And if, if you don't have one, that's okay. In the measure phase, believe me, you'll you'll find one. You'll come up with one. But um, and this will probably generate some ideas too. So let's uh, so so bring them out. What what ideas did uh, did you guys have from our prior sessions? And ideas could just simply mean what problems do you have in yeah. your job? So I wake up every morning. Um, well, I'll give you guys a real world example. Ryan and I were just here early this morning trying to get everything set up because last week was frankly a catastrophe. It was a tough startup. It was a tough start. We realized that our uh, microphone didn't work at all last week, which is why the audio was terrible, because our nine volt battery had run out. And uh, so what we thought was a functioning microphone was actually a completely dead microphone. And so that, among many other things, was a, a, a huge tragedy last week. Not fun. So what did we do about it? We said we have a problem. We do. And we went through the DMAIC process. We defined the problem. We measured our process and we analyzed it. And we said we need to make some improvements. And so with McKinley, our fearless uh, leader over here, she helped us set up a checklist for how to set up our podcast room so we can present to you without any hiccups. Now, what's that fancy word for checklist that gets thrown around all the time? I don't know. Standard work. Did we so all we did is create standard work. Exactly. So today we had standard work. We had a checklist we went through. McKinley guided us through it. 
and we got almost everything right this time. A little more practice needed, but we're, we're that much better. And so that was a little project that we did last week and uh, it, it dramatically improved our work life. McKinley, uh, will you mind reading off to us or telling us a few of the things that we have in our list here? Yes, I will. And also, your screen is showing the next slide as well as the first one. Thank you. I'll fix that. Got it. So we have reducing lead time on shipments. Yeah. Many 5S opportunities. Okay. Very good. Uh, lack of casing. A Kaiser. Uh -huh. <laughs> inventory storage locations, inventory balances. Yeah. Reducing setup time for machine shop parts, reducing oh my. time finding tooling, setup information, program, et cetera. Love it. Excellent. Yes. Lots of good ideas for projects. Ah, so many problems. Okay, great. So a lot of you are with the same company. So we have a couple of big companies uh, in the training this time. If there are multiple people from your company in the training and multiple people in your department or similar departments that you work with, we are going to encourage you to work together on your Lean Six Sigma project. We want, uh, in the past, a lot of Six Sigma programs have said, everybody uh, gets certified as a green belt, you have to have your own project. We don't agree with that approach. We feel that people are more successful when they work together as a team. And if they're going through the class together, they have someone to help support them, answer questions, uh, listen to the training and know what they're supposed to do next. It's just easier to work in a team. So if you have the luxury, of having multiple people in your company currently in this class, we want you to pair up into teams of two. And sometimes we even allow teams of three because in, in some cases it just makes sense to have three people in group work together. You know, For example, we were doing another training and we have a, a maintenance team and there's only three of them in the team and all three of them really are working on the same problem. So they're all, they're all grouped together and they're working on the problems together and they're going to just continually do one project after another as a team, which is great. Right. At the end of the day, uh, the formality of, you know, having a, a, a project leader is not as important as getting a result, getting something done. And that's what we're all about. We want to just get results. But even with that group of three, they can still change off the leadership role. They right? can. So someone can take leadership on one project and someone take leadership on another project and get experience doing those different things. Because inevitably, you're going to come across different problems and, and you're going to have to use different uh, uh, tools in order to help with those problems. Yeah, and great point. And so, in other words... Instead of them working on three projects all at the same time and being, you know, working all alone in, in, in their own world and trying to get it done, they're going to do three projects in series. So they're going to work together on this project, then this one, and then this one, and they're just going to move forward that way. I have to be careful of the hand gestures here. I just Better be careful. That, yeah, 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 don't know what could happen. Yeah, you don't want to do anything wrong with that. Okay, so. Team up if you can. If you're on your own, if you're the only person from your company, then you're still going to form a team for your project. But that team's going to be other people that aren't in the training class. And that's okay too. So there you go. That's our permission for you to team up to work on your Greenbelt project. Um, if there's five of you from your company or 10 of you, we probably don't want all 10 of you on the same project. So probably, you know, teams of two, three at the most is what we're looking for. And even if you're from different parts of the company too, it can be very helpful to have someone who's not familiar with the process to be a part of your team member because they always look at it from the, the rookie glasses, right? The someone who's coming into the process that hasn't ever seen it before. So don't be afraid about mixing things up and that you all have to be doing the same thing. So uh, you know, there, there's all sorts of possibilities with these projects. Absolutely. So if we go back to our project charter, if you guys can remember from last week on the project charter, you have a couple of key roles inside your team. You have the project leader, which is one of you who's taking this class. You've got the project champion, who's an executive level person who's going to sponsor this project and say, hey, if there's any barriers you need to remove, I'll help you remove them. If you, you know, need another department to help you out and they're not you know, playing nice, I'll go you know, be the advocate with them and get them on board. Uh, their job is to allocate resources and to remove barriers. Then you've got the project um, advisors, which is Ryan and I, we're gonna be your advisors uh, for this project. And then finally, you gotta build the team. And the team, as Ryan just said, someone from the outside who doesn't know the process is great to have on the team. And then of course you need someone who knows the process intimately, a subject matter expert on that process. Uh, and then anybody else that might be a key stakeholder. So we did the stakeholder analysis last time, pull those people in, form a team and, and, and get ready to rock and roll. And remember, we're gonna try to do these projects Kaizen style, meaning we're gonna define the problem, we're gonna measure the process, which we're gonna learn about next. 
And then we're going to get the team together. And in a couple of days, we're going to crank through this project and get it all the way done and across the finish line. But why, why not just do it like an hour a week or just add it to a regular meeting? Why, why doesn't that work? Well, in my experience, if you hold a, a weekly meeting, you start the meeting talking about what we talked about last meeting that didn't get done and all the action items. Then we talk about what we should do before the next meeting. And then we all leave thinking uh, we're going to go do it. And then life takes over. Pain. Next week comes around. And we hold the meeting again. And did you did you get your action items done? Oh, I forgot. I didn't have time. I was too busy. I got I got doing something else. Yeah. And so so Tim, just buckle down and do it. It sounds painful, but you'll get faster results with less pain just by carving out some time and get it done. Get it done. Yep. We're gonna lock ourselves in a room. We're gonna get your project all the way across the finish line. Okay. Any additional questions as we recap the define phase? And again, if you don't have your project defined yet, don't worry, we're gonna go in the measure phase next where you can actually start measuring your process and have that surface problems that you can then go work on. So if you don't have a project picked out, that's great. However, by this time next week, you have to have a project picked because you're gonna to need to start getting momentum to get that project across the finish line. Yeah, it's gonna start picking up. And so the, the whole key to the, blink, the, the green belt certification really is that project. And so uh, early on in this process, being able to nail that down uh, because we're gonna use that as a, as a case study throughout this, this whole experience. So you really wanna get that down what is the idea that you're going to do? And you know, with that said, also don't be afraid. Sometimes you get into a project and you do, and you do have to make adjustments. So you know, don't don't get wrapped around thinking that this is the be all and end all. Just think of this as a starting point. We're just going to get a starting point to help us uh, through this to learn this process. So it doesn't have to be uh, anything other than a place to start. Okay. We're going to start the measure phase. We've defined the problem. We understand who's on our team. We understand which process is the potential cause of the problem. So the process for Ryan and I to set up this room was where we needed to focus to improve the quality of the experience. So we have a process that we're going to go focus on. Now we got to go measure that process. So in the measure phase, our key goal is to understand how is that process currently working? And this doesn't mean how it's documented or how it should work. This is mean we actually wanna go see how it actually works. And we wanna measure how the process flows. And then we wanna collect any data we can about that process. So any, any uh, variables, metrics, we're gonna talk a lot about that today. And, and this is not the time to necessarily be nice on the process either. What you said was key. We, we want to understand not what we think it is or not what it should be. We need to understand what it actually is. And there's no substitute uh, for going and actually seeing what's going on because we have to know today what is the current state. Absolutely. So we're going to use a couple of tools here. We're going to use a gimbal walk. You'll learn what that word means in a second. We're going to use value stream mapping and we're going to use run charts or control charts for our data. So those are the primary tools we're going to learn today. If you go on to a black belt level, there's some additional tools you can use in the, the measure phase. But uh, for green belt, these are the core tools that Ryan and I use 99% of the time, the vast majority of projects. Really true. In your handouts, you have a nice checklist here. We also have software that you probably saw an email for called KPI Fire, where this checklist and the, all the checklists that we're going to give you and the tools are in the software. So you can log in and go through this electronically if you don't have this paper binder in front of you. So um, we're gonna show you both of those today. We're gonna start out with just the paper version and then at the end here, we'll show you the electronic version as well. But basically the process flow, here's a list of activities you need to do. The process data, here's a list of activities. You can always come back to this checklist when you're wondering, where am I in the process? What do I do next? If you follow the checklist, you can't go wrong, right? And if you see something on the checklist where you're like, well, that doesn't really apply to this project. Thank you. I was just going to mention that. Were you? Yeah. What do we do? Yeah. Just go ahead and put a non-applicable on it. I mean, for example, we've got Gage r, &R on this list right here, which we are going to talk about today. And Gage r, &R is incredibly powerful within a certain set of parameters, but it's not going to be something that you're going to use for every project. So if you find something on the checklist that isn't applicable, go ahead and skip it. Yeah. Don't stress out and be like, oh, I have to do this. It's on the checklist. It's just, it's not applicable. 
Now, with that said, you don't want to be like, well, I don't really feel like doing a project charter, so I'm just going to ignore that one. No, that if, would be a challenge. If it's listed on the core tools, then it's got to it's got to get done. But uh, you know, gauge R and R is one of those tools that it applies only in some situations. Yeah. Okay. So, in the measure phase, we're going to do process mapping. So, process mapping or value stream mapping is something we use to explain the process steps and how they flow. We're going to understand how efficient our process is where the inventory is in our bottlenecks, and then we're gonna find out if we're pushing or pulling our information or material through that process. Then on the current state data, the big, the second half of the measure phase, we're gonna be looking at how's our process performing? Is it in control? And how far away are we from the target? And what could be causing that? What are, what are the input variables that could cause that? So first word we need to learn today, Gemba. Gemba is a Japanese word that means the place where the work is happening or the scene of the crime. So that sounds ominous. It is ominous. Wow. Scene of the crime. The scene of the crime. Well, if you have a problem, you have to go see the scene of the crime. Now, if you have children like I do, <laughs> when my daughter was very young, we would have my old, his, her older brother come in and be like, your daughter, that's how she's referred to when she's in trouble, your daughter. Not that made a giant mess in the pantry. And so to understand the mess in the pantry, I could have my son describe it to me, or I could actually walk into the pantry to find out that my daughter had found the Nestle Quick, taken the top off, sat down in her diaper, and had started feeding herself chocolate for about an hour, covering the entire pantry and herself in well, chocolate. Who wouldn't? Why it's not? It's perfectly logical what is going on here. Right. You could only understand the magnitude of that mess if you had gone to the Gemba, gone to see what was actually happening. Having my son describe it to me did not do it justice. So this is how it is with problems in our work. We want to go see it for ourselves to understand what's truly happening. So we have to, number one, see it for ourselves, go there, talk to the employees, talk to the people that are experiencing the problem to find out what's really happening. And Tai Chi Ono, one of the founding fathers of the Toyota production system, used to make people stand in the circle where oh, he would genius. draw a circle on the floor. Literally, literally, no joke here. And he would ask people to stand inside that chalk circle on the floor and say, I want you to stand there and observe the process until you truly understand it. And the rumor has it, I don't know if this is true, I wasn't there, I wasn't at the Gemba, but the rumor has it that people would write down some notes for about 15 minutes and then they would walk back to Mr. Ono and say, I think I understand the process. And he would say, well, I think you, you understand some of it, but why don't you go spend quite a bit more time there, maybe a few hours. And the reason for that was there's a lot that goes on in our work yeah. that you can't observe in just a few minutes. You have to spend sufficient time at the Gemba to understand what's truly happening, right? A quick visit for five minutes. Hey, employees, tell me what's wrong. Oh, that's wrong. Okay, I'm out of here. That's not what we mean by going mm -hmm. to the Gemba. No. Okay. What if it makes people nervous? I mean, if you're going out there and watching stuff, how do you... How do you kind of help people as you're as you're watching them? Well, and, and that's an interesting thing. So when I was working at Plexus, the first time I went out to the Gemba, when I was a new manager there, I, I'd walk out and the employees would be like, oh, you know, why is this manager out in my production area? And they were somebody's in trouble. Someone's in trouble. Someone's in trouble. You know, I better work faster because Cedro's here and he's looking over my shoulder. That's right. And it makes people nervous. Like, yep. Why are you here? And so if we go to the Gemba, a lot of times what we like to do is, you know, talk to the employees and ask some questions and, and let them know why you're there. Say, I'm here because I want to help understand your problems so we can help fix your problems. And we want to work with you. And so I would spend a lot of time with my employees and just go out every day. So one of the keys here to good gimbal walks is consistency. You've got yeah. to go up out either every day or on a regular basis. Sounds like a system to me. What a you're describing. system. You got to have a regular routine for going on a gimbal walk so that your employees know that you're going to be there at this time on every day and they get used to it. And so when I started working there, I started going out and talking to the factory folks uh, every day in this one particular factory where we're, we were having problems. And the first time I went out there like, oh, you know, why is Sandra here? They wouldn't really talk, they tell me anything. The next day I go out and I talk to them some more and I get to know their family, you know, about their family and stuff. And we talk and, and uh, they'd start to open up a little bit. And by the time I'd gone out there for, uh, you know, several weeks, they, opened up and they told me what was really happening and they they got less afraid of hiding their problems away and they started to do what I wanted which was surface their problems and, you know I can't fix anything if you don't share it with me I, I don't know how you're suffering when you come to work I can't help you so they finally realized that I was actually there to help and I actually worked on the line with them so I'd go out on the line and I you know get get side by side with them and I'd start assembling parts now granted that hopefully you weren't quiet 
causing quality problems. Uh, right? That was the the main problem with that is like, and it, it's a good idea, but I did slow the process down. I guarantee you did because every time I think about that same thing, I go out to the line, I'm like, oh, I think I'm going to learn this process a little bit better. I can just see the team members kind of shake their head. Like, going, oh man, there goes oh, my man, numbers here goes. today. <laughs> but, but I think you hit on something really key as you were describing it earlier, because you said it's not just the, the what, but the why. You were describing that as you were going out and describing the why I'm here. In fact, I've seen you do this a number of times. When we go out to the Gemba, the place where the work is done, when we're visiting companies, you'll do this right off. You'll come up and say, hi, my name's Sagerl, and I'm here to observe this because I'm trying to learn this. We're just here to help. And you do that, you know, time and time again to create that bridge. And I think that, you know, not just explaining the what we're doing and how we're doing it, but why we're doing it becomes the key. Yeah, exactly. Having a reason behind your, your gimbal walk. So we call these gimbal walks because you create a regular routine as a manager, a leader, a, a team member to go and visit the actual place if you're not already working in it right now. Many of you are already working in your job. But let's say you want to figure out, you know, why is the warehouse team always, you know, late delivering the materials I need? Well, Go to the Gemba, go spend time with them, go talk to them and get that information from them. That's the best way that you can learn. Okay? I also heard you talk about trust because you, you were trying to build this bridge and and people just didn't want to you know, say what was on their mind right off. It, it took time, didn't it? Yeah, it does. It's not a one and done thing. Mm -hmm. To get people's trust takes an investment. They have to know that you care about them and that you're not there to judge them or penalize them or something like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So this is a fun story that I like. Uh, General Fremont, uh, he was one of the generals um, when Abraham Lincoln was president. And Abraham Lincoln said, you know, I've lost confidence in this general because, the, he, well, he's lost the confidence of the men near him who support any man in this position must have to be successful. His cardinal mistake is that he isolates himself and allows nobody to see him, by which he does not know what is going on in the very matter he's dealing with. I don't know if he got fired or what. I think he did. They all got fired. You know, <laughs> up until Grant, every union general got fired eventually. Eventually, it was, it was, a, it was a long string of, of failures. But you know, speaking about that, I, you know, in um, uh, Power Blanket, uh, one of my prior companies, when you know our busiest season, uh, th there was a lot going on, and uh, I took to just taking a little fold-up table, and I would literally take my laptop and fold-up table, and I would just spend all day out on the floor as we were working through uh, several issues. So, you know, going there and kind of eliminating that barrier between that uh, office wall between you and the floor becomes key. Yeah, it really does. So how do we do gimbal walks? Well, you can go on a daily gimbal walk where you're just, as if you're a manager or supervisor, you're going out every day and you're learning uh, what the employees are doing, what the problems they're having. You're just going out to surface problems. Now, the key here is if you're going to surface problems, you got to execute on, you got to resolve those problems or have a system for resolving those problems. If you don't have that system in place, we're going to teach you how to put that system in place so that you don't get employee feedback and then do nothing with it. And then the employees are frustrated. I think we got a question here. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, how do you do a Gemba walk when it is a, a virtual environment, such as online ordering issues and the order flow through the ERP system? Oh, so an electronic environment. So quick question, guys. Can you hear McKinley? Are you mic'd? Can you guys hear McKinley? Just type yes if you can. If not, yes. Let's see. yes. <laughs> okay. You can we can hear that Perfect. guy right there. All right. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Hello, you guys. There we go. Hey there. So you can't see McKinley, but you can hear. Um, so great question. The question is if you have an electronic flow, uh, how do you go to the Gemba and watch that happen? If you're passing information from one group to the other, um, it's kind of the same process. Usually that process involves information going from one person to another person to another person, one department to another. You can do that by physically going and talking to each person in that process and watching them do their job. I mean, maybe a little boring, right? They're filling out a form and, but they'll tell you what happens. I you know I fill out this customer you know, request and then it gets sent over to this manager and who knows what happens to them. All I know is I have to wait five days to get a response. Oh, okay. So then you go to the Gemba, you walk over to the manager and say, hey, I noticed that you get these requests from this other employee. And, uh, you know, can you tell me what happens? Have that manager explain, well, my process is I have to do this and this and this. And you watch them do it. And you and now that we have, you know, we're also used to using Zoom meetings or online meetings, we can all do this electronically. Let's get everybody in the process on a Zoom call and let's have them share their screens and we can record and we can watch the electronic information pass from one group to the other, just like you were going to the, uh, the production line and watching a physical product move. Or if you're in a hospital, 
you know, you're watching a patient move through the process, right? Whatever's moving, that's what you want to go watch. Yeah, in fact, this, in, in some respects, our environment today has never been easier to go to the Gemba because some of you work in environments that are a multinational environment. And so you literally not only have, uh, you know, a sister plant uh, around the, the States, but you may have one over in Europe or some other place, but taking the phone, you know, and using that as the medium of communication to, uh, you know, on a Zoom, for example, about being able to not only see the process within your area, but see other processes as they're taking place. It's almost never been easier than today. Yeah. Did that answer the question? More or less. <laughs> More or less. Okay, if there's a follow on or we didn't go deeper, um, this is something we can help you do in your project. Uh, but if you have a follow on question, go ahead and throw it in the chat window. McKinley will uh, read it to us. Um, th the second type of walk that we do is called a, a project gimbal walk, which is we're going out specifically as part of a project to solve a problem. So when you guys start your Greenbelt projects, every one of you in the measure phase is going to say, let's go watch the process. So you don't have to be a manager. You don't have to set up a routine. You just have to go and watch it and do that enough to where you understand the process so that you can create your value stream map, which is coming up. So e even if you are, know the process extremely well, going out to, as you're doing your project, uh, builds that bridge because you don't necessarily know how it's going today. Even though this is something that you may have done a little while ago, you don't know how it's going on today. So just go see. Okay. Now, when you do a gimbal walk, there's a transaction of information, right? So the employees do play a role in the gimbal walk. If you're going out to watch employees do their job, whatever that job is, their job is to help surface problems and look for abnormal conditions. So an abnormal condition is anytime the process deviates from the standard way it should be done, right? So is there an abnormal amount of inventory here? Are there too many employees, too few employees? Are we not following the process steps? The employee's job is to surface those problems and explain those to anybody who's out there observing. So um, anytime we have best practices as well. So if you go observe a process and you see they're doing a really good job, you can think, OK, can we take the way these guys do the, their job and share that with these other areas so that they can all do it the same way? So we're looking for waste, variation and overburdening. So I'm gonna share a little video here with you guys. I can pull it up. Let's see if that shows up on my screen. That's just a great picture of the observer there, that old silverback. Tell you what, if there's uh that that's an intimidating stare right there. Let's see, here, let's see if I can pull this up. Come on, YouTube, you can do it. There are three sources of commercial. Well, I guess we're going to be instructed on weight loss. I just want anyone to know about it. And if you're trying to lose weight, we're, we're you need to know what these circuits are. Loss, so don't confuse this the weight loss. This is a test of selective attention. Count, Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Get ready, guys. Got to count. One, two, three. And just the white ones. Just the people wearing white. Four. I don't know. I, I hope they're not trying out for the NBA. I don't think they would cut it, but. How, How many passes, passes did you count? count? Correct. The correct. All right. How many passes did you count? How many of you got 15? Somebody had 15 in the window. Excellent. <laughs> you guys are way ahead of us. 13. That's pretty good. Some of us have more attention to detail others. I can tell you between Ryan and I, <laughs> one of us has better attention to detail one than, than the other one. I can tell you that right now. Okay. Correct answer is 15 passes. But, but, but did you see the gorilla? The gorilla? <laughs> There's a variation of the process right there. This video, this video is from, is from research, research by Daniel, by Daniel Simons, Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. So there you go. So did you see the gorilla? That is the question. How many of you saw the gorilla? Or is there anybody that would be willing to admit that they did not see the gorilla? I see a yes. A few people, yes, yes. Yes. 
I did not see the gorilla. You did not? McKinley didn't see the gorilla. Our own McKinley didn't. I feel like because I have a very poor attention to detail, I was actually able to see the gorilla because I found it really hard to just count the, the basketballs and do what I was told, right? I was just, you know, naturally not very good at following directions anyway. But I gravitated to the gorilla simply because the gorilla was on a separate plane on a separate timeline almost because everyone else was doing much faster reaction than all of a sudden kind of this slow moving gorilla goes through the uh, through the scenery. Right it's like, right now, wait a minute here. There's something that doesn't belong. It's an abnormal condition. That's what I mean to be thinking. That's exactly what it is. So when uh, the, the point of this is that you can go out and observe a process. And if all you're looking for is one specific thing, you may miss the big picture. The big picture. You may miss other problems that are right in front of your face. That are right there. It's kind of like when you, you know, when you buy a new car, you know, you're like, wait, I didn't realize that there were so many Toyota Camrys in the world until I bought one, and everything's a Camry or a Volkswagen Bug. Now I see Volkswagen Bugs everywhere. And so you tend to find what you're looking for. So when we go out to the Gemba, we want number one, we want to be looking for waste, variation, and overburdening. So we definitely want to zero in on those things. But we want to be generally observant to see, you know, man, I, I didn't come here to solve the problem of this uh, this employee having to walk all over the place to do their job. But now that I'm here, I'm noticing that that employee is walking all over the place to get their job done. There's a lot of, of transportation waste there, a lot of motion waste. And so observing that while you're at the Gemba is really important. Next thing you want to do, take good pictures, right? This is an example of one of the hospitals that uh, Ryan and I work with. And this is just a, a messy area. And so I always know that if I see a mess, I want to take a picture because at some point we're going to do a 5S project to clean up that mess. And it's not going to be a mess anymore. And I want to have a picture of the before state before we, we go fix it. So take pictures, take video. That's a great way to observe. Here's how the process works today. Okay. So wrap up on the Gemba, get out of our chairs, go to the place, help get understanding with the employees, get agreement on what's really wrong and have empathy, have a, you know, Boy, feel for the people that are living with problems every day in their job and say, man, we, we want to make this better for you. Right? Yeah, exactly. Because if you if you look at it and say, hey, they're here today just trying to do their best and clearly something's in their way, all we're trying to do is identify those things that are in the way so we can systematically help them remove. But clearly they came here today to be successful. It's our job to help them be successful. Yep. And your job as a green belt is to help eliminate barriers so that your team and your employees can be successful. So... Value stream mapping. That's the end of the Gemba section. Now we're going to dive right into value stream mapping. We've gone to the Gemba. We're now observing the process. Why are we here? Well, because we want to map out the process to show how it actually works. So I'm confused, though. We're switching animals. We were just talking about gorillas. Yep, now we're on tigers. So can you find the hidden tiger mm. on the screen? Can you find the hidden tiger on the screen? Go ahead and put in the chat if you can find the hidden tiger. Don't give away the secret, but let us know if you can see the hidden tiger. It's not small. It seems to be hidden. It is hidden, but it's not small. In fact, it's rather in front of you almost. It is, and pretty big. Yep. Found it. Oh, love it. All right. That's our good friend, BJ from Hammerton. <laughs> How you doing, BJ? Excellent. He's doing awesome. Love it. And now let's find the hidden tiger. It is literally right in front of you. Of course, that's what my wife says when I'm looking for something in the fridge. She says, it's right in front of you. And it, it only which, shows up when she comes to get it, right? Right, to which I reply, if I could see that it was right in front of me, I wouldn't have to have you tell me that it was right in front of me. I would see it, but I don't. Women have this magical power where they can make things appear that I can't see. It is amazing. It is amazing. I don't know. All right, excellent. So I found words that say the hidden tiger. Okay, so you, excellent, you did it. Right there on the tiger are the stripes, and the stripes say the hidden tiger uh, spelled out in letters. So that's where the hidden tiger is. So again, when we go out to map the process, sometimes we think we're looking for one thing, but actually what the real problem is hidden in plain sight. Um, I have tons of examples of this where I went out and mapped a process and the problem was right there in front of us the whole time. 
And we, we just didn't see it because we get so used to it. We get so used to seeing things yeah. the way they are and uh, not thinking of, oh, wow, how, how could this be different, right? What, what, what waste are we living with on a daily basis? So we're going to learn about different process mapping tools, right? I've got this little guy on my screen. Let me minimize that. Get it out of the way. There we go. Hopefully that gets that out of the way. Yes, it does. All right. Perfect. Okay. So a couple of process mapping tools. We're going to do learn how to do process flow diagrams. We're going to learn how to do SIPOCs, value stream maps, spaghetti diagrams, and swim lane diagrams, which are all basically different variants of how to map out a process from start to finish. And just a reminder, sometimes some of these tools will be more helpful than others. So let's just go through them. Ah, that's a good point. So I will tell you that the value stream map that we are going to teach you today is a very simplified version of a traditional value stream map. It's the one that Ryan and I use, again, 99% of the time. Every time we go into a client to work with them, we're using this value stream map. So we'll show you. In fact, you we've, we've never been to a client without doing this, too. I mean, that, that's another kind of key takeaway that this, that, you know, and, and we cannot describe the number of, of uh, revelations that come up just by this initial process. So this is, we've, we've never done a project without doing this. It is probably, would you say, the most effective tool in our problem solving process? It, it is, especially once we start analyzing the numbers associated with the times we're talking about here. It just becomes mind boggling how much waste is involved in the process. So value stream mapping is going to be something you do on every single project from now until forever. This is not an optional tool. Value stream mapping is a must do tool. So we're doing it to help us see the process and uh, a value stream map is just a variant on a, on a basic process map. And we'll go through what that means. So if you're looking at some books to read, these are Learning to See was the original book that was written many years ago on value stream yep. mapping. 2008. They, they teach the traditional approach. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to teach you a simplified approach, which looks like this. Oh, that's messy. Oh, my goodness. It's a bunch of sticky notes on the wall. And what do those sticky notes tell us? Well, every sticky note on the top you see with those little red dashes on it, those sticky notes show us the process steps. And then all the sticky notes down below that show us all the waste, all the variation, all the overburdening. And then you can see all the scribble notes around that. That's us going through the DMAIC process on the whiteboard around this value stream map to solve problems. So this was at a, a fish food factory that we were working with that was trying to optimize how they produce more fish food with better quality. And we were you know, trying to solve all sorts of problems for them. So every day we would get on the board and we would value stream map and solve problems that came from the value stream map. I'm sure the fish really appreciated that you were doing this, that you were finding more effective ways to feed them. There are fewer hungry fish in the world because is, of these projects. Yeah, so if you have a, a, a fish tank at home with fish in it, you should be grateful for this value stream map you're looking at right here. Or a multi-billion dollar fish hatchery, either one of those, yeah. So you're, if you're thinking of the demand problem solving in a linear fashion, it's really not, right? You can define the problem and then go measure the process. But what you can also do is map out a process to find all the waste and then use all the waste that you find in your value stream map to go start a bunch of Lean Six Sigma projects. And that's actually a really good approach, right? A lot of people think, well, I have to have a problem before I can go solve it. Well, no, you really don't. Let's go map the process, find out where all the waste is. That's what value stream mapping is going to do for us. We're going to map it out and we're going to find the waste. So, so if I hear you right, every one of those notes that you have below that process, everyone that's going this way could potentially be a project in and of itself. It, it is, absolutely. So we can map the process at the beginning of the continuous improvement cycle, just mapping it out or we can do it as part of the measure phase of the DMAIC project. Either one doesn't matter, as long as you go out and map the process at some point to find your waste. So it's gonna answer a few, questions, uh, a few questions for us. Where is the flow and flow interruptions, the barriers to our flow? What's preventing the flow? And what is our overall process efficiency? How much of our process is actually value added work versus waste? Um, where are our quality issues? Are we pushing or pulling? and how much inventory and whip do we have in place? So at the end of the day, where are all the opportunities to improve? That's what the value stream map is going to tell us. So what do I mean by flow? Well, if I'm producing a cell phone in my factory, for example, I want the raw material to come into my factory for the cell phone, all the parts, the glass and the chips and everything. And I want it to flow smoothly through my factory and come out the other end 
in one continuous motion. It's always moving. This part that we're, we're building is always moving. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you, I think we've got an issue here because I, I'm working in the same factory, but this has metal parts and I need to stamp those metal parts. And if you're telling me that I got to keep that thing moving, you're telling me I've got to stop stamping to change over for the next model so that I can get stamping again. Is that what you're trying to tell me? It's not all about keeping the equipment busy. It's not all about keeping the people busy even. If I walk into a factory and I see idle I equipment, I don't really care. If I see idle people, I don't really care. What I do care about is, do I see idle product? If the product is sitting and not moving, I know the product isn't flowing. And so a lot of companies are really focused on keeping their equipment moving and their people moving, but it really doesn't matter. All that matters is, is the product moving? Now, the same principle applies to transactional processes. So if I'm in, let's say the uh, customer service department and I got a customer complaint come in, that customer complaint is the part. And I want that customer complaint to move through our response process without ever stopping just in one continuous flow. Wait, now you're advocating not putting somebody on hold forever? This is <laughs> or, or saying, we'll call you back in five days this or something crazy. like that. No, we want it to flow and get resolved as quickly as possible. So anytime there's a delay in us resolving that customer complaint, anytime you know we have to give them a refund, but that has to wait for a manager approval and that manager's on vacation in the Bahamas for the next two weeks, that delay in the customer complaint moving through the process is interrupting our flow. That's what we're capturing on our value stream app. Any interruptions to that flow? Yeah, exactly. Now let's go back to the manufacturing floor example we were talking about a minute ago because there is some logic behind, you know, keep that machine moving. So if you're not familiar with this logic, I just want to acquaint you what's going on. Oftentimes, if the company's making a, you know, multi-million dollar investment in this machine, this is a great example about being focused on the part and losing sight of the bigger picture. This goes back to the hidden tiger example. So from an accounting perspective, if you say, wow, we spent all this money on this one machine right here, therefore the only way we're gonna get our ROI is to keep this machine moving. That's how we're gonna, from an accounting perspective, prove that that was a good investment. That's losing sight of exactly what it is you're trying to accomplish because what you're really trying to accomplish is that machine is there to serve the customer. And so the only way to serve the customer in the best way is to keep that product going through the process. That machine is just part of the overall picture. So don't get stuck on one machine and trying to optimize that one machine. We're trying to optimize the process that that machine is in. And when we say optimize the process, we're talking about the value stream. So Ryan and I will use that term interchangeably. We'll say we want to optimize the process or improve the process. If we say we want to optimize the value stream, improve the value stream, we're saying the same thing. Now, the difference is a value stream is all the value added points from the time the process starts until it ends. So if we're looking at making a phone, from the time we order a customer places an order till we order materials, build the phone, ship it, deliver it to the customer, that's the end-to-end -end value stream. Now there's lots of small value streams and we'll talk about that in a second. So we identify all the waste and variation in our value stream and we try to then eliminate that so that we can create a better flow where there's nothing but value being added all the way through the process. Now, how do we create this value stream map? First, we, first of all, we got to work as a team. So we get everyone together. We never create a value stream in a vacuum on our own, right? And we never want to just go to the whiteboard and start the value stream map without first going to the Gemba. Because when we capture all the process steps, we often only remember the value added steps. Well, first I do this and then I do that. But what about all the waste in between those value added points? Yeah. That's why we've got to go to the Gemba to see what really happens and capture all of it. So we work as a team. Second thing we do is we document all of the, I'm going to actually skip slides. Well, let me go back. We document all of the steps in the process with, in this case, the yellow sticky. So if you look on the screen, you can see the yellow stickies going across. Those are the process steps. And then below each step, you see the pink sticky notes, which are all the waste variation and overburdening we identified for that step. Then in this example, you'll see that the, it's organized into rows. Those are called swim lanes. So each of those swim lanes represents a department person or team that is doing the work. So you can see in this process, the work starts at this first department up top, and then it works its way down and the work is 
moving from one department or one step to the next until it comes out the end. Sounds like you're capturing the handoffs then. That's exactly right. Every time we're skipping a, uh, a row. Every time there's a handoff, either the material goes from my station to your station, or my, the information goes from my department to your department. Anytime there's a handoff, the swim lane diagram just captures who it's going to and where it's coming from. So if you're looking at the order to cash value stream, meaning from the time the order is placed until the time the company receives the cash for that order, then oftentimes you'll encompass things like sales. So sales will take the order, then the order is gonna get handed off to somebody to perform. Then even within production, it usually gets handed off several times uh, before it gets handed off to accounting to collect the cash. And so that's one way of thinking about all those different handoffs. Oh. So up top, you see we have the current state value stream with our steps and our pink sticky notes for our problems. Down below, you'll see we've got a future state value stream map, which shows when we get to the improved phase, we're going to recreate the value stream map, designing it for the future state. So in this case, we use green sticky notes to say these are the future state process steps. And the blue sticky notes down below, instead of being problems, are action items. These are the action items we have to implement to make that new process up above work. So that's the difference between the current state, which is the yellow and pink sticky notes, and the future state, which is the green and blue sticky notes. Okay. So value stream apps can happen at different levels of the company. So Ryan and I were just talking about order to cash. Customer places an order, we build the, pro the product, and we ship it. Great. That's a company-wide value stream. Most of your projects are not going to be at that level unless you're on the executive team or you're the you know, person responsible for the entire business, the, the VP. You don't need to do a company-wide value stream. We're going to be looking at department value streams or product family value streams or even sub-process value streams. So for example, I'm making this phone. There's a company-wide value stream of companies, people ordering phones, us building them and shipping and selling them. But for my department, I'm responsible just for the case. I'm the guy who has to put the case on every phone before it ships. I don't know why these phones ship with cases, but they do. Well, I don't know either, but in this case, I guess we- it, It's fantastic. It every is. phone comes with a free case. I, so for my department, I need to figure out how do I improve the throughput and the quality of me putting the case on the phone? So my value stream app is going to be very, very small compared to the company-wide but it's gonna be very, very important for me. So my steps are, I have to grab the phone, I have to grab the case, I have to wipe off the glass on the phone, inspect the case to make sure it's good, put the two together, check that I've assembled it correctly, and then pass it on to the next step. All of those steps that I just described would be my value stream for my area. And that's it. So whatever the process is for your area, you're going to go fix, you're gonna go work on, that's what you map out. An easy way to think about this is look at from the eyes of the customer. If you were the customer in the factory watching that product move through, what you're trying to document is the movement of that thing through that process. Now, I explained the current state and future state value stream map, but one question that you should be asking is, why does this value stream look nothing like the giant mess that Ryan and Cedro show when they do a value stream? Well, here's the difference. This is a, an example of an electronically created value stream done in uh, Visio or Microsoft Excel. And it shows all the process steps and all the information. But unfortunately, we, this isn't very useful when you're trying to get a team together to map out a process. You don't wanna sit around a computer and drag boxes and, and you know, make it all fancy and pretty. We would much rather have you get your team together on a wall or a whiteboard with some sticky notes and map it out. And the, and the benefit of that is one, it's fast. Number two, everyone can see it and read it. And number three, everyone can participate. They can all put their own sticky notes on, say, I think this is a problem. They write it on a pink sticky note, boom, stick it on the wall. Everybody's involved. And the value stream map looks like a mess, but it's really helpful in opening everybody's eyes as to what's really going on in the process. A lot of times when I've created a future state, for example, then I, you know, we've done this on the board, then go back to the example on, on Visio. Then if you want to document it and make it so that you can hand it out and explain it to people, then that's a great way to do it too. So, you yeah. know, they're not mutually exclusive. It's just easier to work with people on the board with sticky notes, and then we can document it this way and, uh, and hand it to the team so they can see what's going on. Yep, absolutely. So for your Greenbelt project, you're going to do a value stream map. 
Ryan and I's expectation for you to get certified is that it will look like this. It's going to be a sticky note mess on the wall. That's okay. And it's a beautiful thing. And then to put it into your report out for your project at the end of the Greenbelt training, all you have to do is snap a, a high quality photo of it, which uh, pretty much any phone these days will do. Take that photo, put it into your PowerPoint presentation to report out on your project and you're done. So it's really, really fast and you don't have to be a, a Microsoft Visio or Excel wizard to map out the process. But if you are, you can have a lot of fun doing that. If you are, you can certainly submit one that looks like the traditional ones and uh, that's a okay. Yep. So we're going to the Gamba. Before we start our master map, we need to know where it starts and ends. So where's the process process start and end? And then how do we fill in the blanks? So I've created a flow chart here for you to see all the steps of creating a value stream map. So let's go through them one by one. First, we're going to grab our yellow sticky notes and we're going to list all of the process steps. So we take our yellow sticky notes, we put them boom, on the wall. Boom, boom, boom. Next time we train to this, we're going to have the board right. We should have us. the board right behind us and we should create it. Well, we could wheel it in here. So when we take a break, maybe we can wheel it in here and, and, and map that out. And map it out. And I think that would be brilliant, actually. Yeah. Should we do that? Yeah, let's do that. Let's it's the top break. of the hour. Yeah. We're going to take like a what? Let's call it 10 minute break. A 10 minute break. Yep. When we come back, we're going to wheel the whiteboard in here and we're going to show you how Ryan and I would actually do a value stream app. Okay, ready, set, go. All right. Come back. Hope you had a good stretch break there. Excellent. All right. So we're going to go through the steps. We're going to go through the steps of creating a value stream map right now. And we're going Let's to do, do it for it. real. Let's do it for real. So peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly. Some peanut butter and jelly. Like we would get our team together, which is Ryan and I in McKinley, and we would say, hey, we're going to map out the peanut butter and jelly process. So I would say, Ryan, as a process wait expert. I thought peanut butter and jelly could be done anyway. No, it absolutely has to be done a critical way. There's a very important way it has to be done. My, my very young son, when he's now 18, when he was very young, he said, Mom, I want you to make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich exactly the way you made it yesterday. It was so delicious. And my wife said, sure, I can do that for you. So very she, accommodating. She made him a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. She stuck it in front of him. And my son got a sad face. He's like, I don't know, three, four years old, got a really sad face. He's like, Mom, that isn't the way you made it last time. I wanted it with the jelly on top. And so my wife smiled and she grabbed the sandwich and she picked it up, flipped it over and set it back down. And my son realizing how silly it was, just started busting up laughing and they were both cracking up because of course she had made it with the jelly on bottom, which was wrong. So she made it with the jelly on top. And that way it tastes better. That way it tastes better. Genius. So, as the process expert, what is the first step in the process? Well, let's see. I think the first thing, if we're going to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, we better start assembling the items. So we probably better get the bread. Okay, so I wrote assemble items. So assemble items right here. And then if we want more detail on that, we can add you know additional detail on there. So we can make it as simple as get bread. So again, the level of detail you go to is entirely up to you. I can write assemble all items if we know what those are, but if that's not descriptive enough, it's important to write the description of you know get bread. Um, you know, pull jam from fridge, get knife, things like that. Now, the reason we would go to that level of detail, get bread, pull jam from the fridge, get the knife is because why? Why would we do that? It's an excellent question. When we think about the movement that's involved in all of that, if really we're, you know, in, in this particular case, we're trying to understand the waste and the variation of the overburdening of what's going on here, getting that, you know, do I have to go over to this part of the kitchen to get the knife, but then I go to the opposite side to go get the bread. If, you know, if, uh, if that is the level of detail we were trying to understand, then absolutely, those are critical parts of the process to map out. It really is. And think of the difference. If we just put assemble items up here, what's the assumption? Oh, that's pretty easy, no big deal. We assemble the items. We're only documenting the value added work, which is really easy to do. And that's a big trap you could run into with value stream mapping. But by saying, well, I have to first get the bread, then I have to get the jam, then I have to get the knife. Now I'm identifying, oh, there's a lot of steps to 
getting assembling the items and there may be waste in there so what is some waste involved with this well i i think for example that you know going back to the, the example i was just mentioning if they're located in different parts of the kitchen then i have to walk so i'm walking so i've got the waste of motion i'm, I'm moving the operator i'm trying to add value to my customer in this case sadro son so i'm trying to add value to my customer but i've got to go over here and over here so i'm i'm doing the motion waste is involved in that if i've got to go you know all this walking to go find something and this is where we can know that we have waste and we can write it down we can also go back to the gemba and actually watch this happen it's like well i don't really know what it looks like when we get jam out of the fridge what does that look like oh i gotta walk from here to there so i walk to the fridge and then you can document okay well how far is it to the fridge well it's 20 feet Apparently, I have an, an you incredibly have a massive kitchen. Well, this is an industrial kitchen. We're oh, making, true. We're right. making a lot of peanut butter sandwiches here. So right. I got to walk 20 feet so I can put it there. And then the other thing I like to do is sometimes I'll just put a little M or, a, you know, remember the acronym for waste, the downtime, defects, overproduction, waiting, non utilized talent, transportation, inventory, motion, and excess processing. I will often just write a little an M up there to say, oh, this is motion waste on this pink sticky note. So either a D-O-W-N or a T-I-M-E. Exactly. So what's some other waste in this? Um, we go to get the bread. Here's a common one in my house. Yeah. There's only the healthy bread. Oh, no. And my kids don't want the healthy bread. Oh, so there's, no. there's no white bread available. And they have to, heaven forbid, use the healthy use the healthy uh, bread or or they just won't they'll give up and they'll say you know i'm not even going to make a sandwich today so from their perspective they would call that the d right they're saying there's a defect there's a defect there's no white bread there's no white bread mom would probably say that's not a defect at all in fact we should have more of that healthy bread and then i'm and then another common problem is if there is no white bread they will have to walk to the garage fridge oh goodness to check and see is there by chance on the luckiest day a loaf of white bread happens in the just to be there for their consumption and if there's not any white bread or there's no bread in the fridge or another problem that happens is so so we've we've done more waste of motion then the only thing left of the bread is the no. stale end so no. i got a loaf of bread in my house no somebody ate all the middle all they left for the ends that can't be but they didn't bother to throw it away they just left it on the counter so i think another defect is in place here. yeah so we got motion waste yeah and then we have a defect here so yeah. i've got my process step i've got three different wastes that i've identified underneath that process step before it goes to the next process step okay Make sense? All right. This is literally how we create the value stream map. We go through it. And then if we have questions about anything, we're just going to leave. We're going to go to the Gemba. Whoop. Okay, I went to the Gemba and we found more waste. And we're capturing all that waste here as we go and do it and then put it on the wall. Okay. So second step in my value stream. So if you look on the, on the whiteboard up here on the screen, document the process steps, which we did. How are the steps linked together? So is this a push or a pull? A push means that I can do my step as fast as I want, and then I just push it to, to Ryan. A pull means regardless of my rate of work, right? He's, regardless of how fast he's going, he's just going to push it my way. And then a pull process, when Ryan's ready for me to do more work, he'll give me a signal. I give a signal, say I'm ready. And I'll do more. Most processes we've found are push. And the symbol for push is very simple, a forward arrow. So we will just write a push process on there, or if you want, go ahead. Yeah. You can put it uh, between can, these two steps. Scoot it on over, which is why we like to use the uh, whiteboards, the, the whiteboards yeah. and sticky notes, because it's a lot easier to move these around, because you always do. So if it's a push process, we put a push arrow. Now, in the in the rare case that you already have a pull process in place, meaning there's a signal between the two steps, you can let's put a pull process right here. You can make a little loop arrow. And that loop arrow means that there's a pull process in place. And pull is what we want. We'll go deeper into that in a later session. Uh, but for today, push or pull, um, that's all you need to know. The next thing that we need to know is how much inventory is piling up in between each step. Mm. So if there's a push process between these two, there's a good chance that there's going to be inventory filling up uh, some amount of work in progress. Now, this isn't just for physical products. This is also for electronic information processes. If I'm the manager, and I have to approve everybody's expense reports. 
So every, every day employees are submitting expense reports and I'm waiting for all those expense reports to come in. In one big batch? In one big batch. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the week or end of the month, I'm gonna approve them all. I might have you know, 30 expense reports from my 30 employees sitting there waiting for me. So we do a symbol for inventory that looks like a little triangle with an eye inside of it. And that represents inventory. And so we'll put that exactly like that in between whichever step we see inventory piling up at, okay? So next thing, show product or information inventory. Now we're creating value added, non-value added times. So this step right here, value add, non-value added times. How do we do that? If this get knife step takes 10 seconds to do, but only two seconds of that is really value added time. Meaning the actual getting of the knife is adding value because I'm, I'm, I'm getting the tool I need to do the job. But there's eight seconds of walking waste in here. So we'll write that down and we'll say two seconds of value added time, 10 seconds of total time, which means we have eight seconds of waste. So there's waste, value, and our total time, All right? And then what we'll do here is we'll just put those times underneath each step. So how long does it take to get the bread? Well, that takes, you know, 12 seconds. Pulling the jam from the fridge, that takes 20 seconds. Getting the knife takes 10 seconds. And then we'll write the value add next to each one. So getting the bread of that 12 seconds, only five seconds of that was value add. Pulling jam from the fridge, only five seconds of that was value add. And getting the knife, only two seconds of that was value add. Now, as a recap, value add, there's a definition for value add, right? Did we change the form, fit, or function? So if we change the form, fit, or function, and the customer wants to pay for it, then that counts as value add. And what's interesting is most of these activities, although I'm using this example, really aren't value add. We're just assembling materials, which isn't a value add activity. We haven't changed the form, fit, or function of the product yet. Right? Yeah. In fact, a few weeks ago, I was working with a company, and we were working on the, uh, the order to cash value stream. So the amount of time from the customer perspective, from the time the customer placed the order until the customer paid for it, we did the, this very calculation right here. We found there was 524 hours of, of activity going on. And of that 524 hours, only 11 hours were actually changing the form fit or function that the customer wanted to pay for. Uh, so we came up with a, about a 96% waste in the process. And that's very common. Absolutely. It's really common for a lot of the activities to be pure waste. So if we look at this example right here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add up my value added time, VAT. I want a better view of the whiteboard. Alex asked, yeah, Alex asked, can you get a better view of the whiteboard? Maybe do it in front of the table. We sure can. Maybe you could zoom in on it for oh, us a little bit here. That'd be great. All right. So you don't need to see us as much as zoom in. So there we go. Perfect. Thanks for the feedback. We appreciate that. And then now all that does is accentuate my terrible handwriting. I usually find somebody with really good handwriting to do this part of the process. Do you guys want it zoomed in more? No, this no, that's perfect. Okay. This is perfect. Yeah. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll look at the total times here. And then what we can calculate is a process efficiency, which is really cool. So I can say, look, this was 12 seconds of value added time. So that's my value. Five plus five plus two. That's where it's getting the Five 12. plus five plus two equals 12. And then I'm going to divide that by my total time, which is 12 plus 20 plus 10. So that's 42, right? And then that's going to give me, am I running off the screen yet? Yes, yeah, I am. Bit. That's okay. That's okay. That's going to give me my percentage. So what's 12 divided by 42? It's about 25%. I don't know. You guys do the math. About 25% efficiency 20. oh, 28 and a half there you go so once you've done your value stream app you can look at those value add times versus total time and you can get a process efficiency like ryan said a lot of times, it's not uncommon for us to have a process that's only five percent efficient yeah I've, I've i've worked with processes that are literally 
less than 1% efficient. He'll go through the garage door example here in a, in a future class, I think. We'll, we'll show you that project. But literally, they would spend an entire week doing this really high-end custom work. And only a, a few hours of that week was actually creating value for the customer. Changing the form fitter function and the customer wanted to pay for it. Yeah, that's right. A lot, okay. of it, a lot of it was transportation and waste, but that is extremely common. Everybody does this. It does. So now that we've done this for every single step, we put our inventory values here. So sometimes what we'll do is write inventory and we'll write, you know, there's 30 pieces or 30 parts in inventory on average in between those steps. We've calculated our times. The next step in the process is to list any electronic information that is uh, coming in or out of the process. So what we'll do there is, we took this guy off, we'll say what sort of inputs are happening to this process. So to get the bread, to get the jam, the input here is there's an electronic uh, order coming in and it says we want strawberry. So we say there's a jam type that is brought in here. So you can list the electronic inputs to each process step if there are any. Now, uh, if it's a manufacturing process, a lot of times what we'll also do is instead of putting the electronic input there, we'll just simply list it as another process step in between, which is the beauty of having sticky notes. Because if I say, oh, I forgot a step here, we're supposed to get the jam type from the customer. Well, no problem. I'll just move everything over, put that there, and I'll say, get jam type from customer. So I get the jam type from the customer, and I've now inserted that electronic order step into my process. Okay. So whether you put it on top or put it inside doesn't really matter. Again, the whole point of this is how does the process flow and where's the waste? And start measuring it. And yeah, no, how big is it? How much do we have? Yeah, it's it's uh, as we're talking about this measuring phase right here. The you know the key to this is mapping it out so that we can see, but we're also getting measurements because we're trying to take a before and after. We're trying to understand uh, if this is what our process was like before, certainly we can have a better process later. But one of those valuations is to know what's the difference in the numbers. Absolutely. So the last step in the process then is to identify problems or opportunities, but we've already kind of been doing that throughout. So as we list process steps, a lot of times people in the team are thinking about that step in that moment. And that's a good time to ask for waste. So sometimes you can map the whole process out and then go back and think of the waste. But mostly what happens in reality is we're at this step and we think, okay, what goes wrong here? And we list it out. So we've got our, our pile of pink stickies and we're just boom, 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 boom. We're just adding all of those waste down beneath each of the steps. Another quick tip is if you have a good way to think about those pink slips is to start with a problem is. In other words, don't, don't just point. use a little you know, one or two words because you won't remember what it was you were trying to capture. So to the best you can, so that you can see these examples, you know, walk to the fridge. You didn't just put fridge or no white bread. He just didn't, you know. So a problem is, is a good way to think about those pink sticky notes. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. You don't want to make these amb ambiguous. They, you're going to come back to this value stream app in two days, three days, next week. And if the words you wrote were short and non-descriptive, it's going to be really hard to remember. Or somebody else walks in, a manager walks in, they're like, what does that mean? What does that mean? You're going to have to explain everything. It's better to write in more complete sentences and say, I have to, a problem is I walk to the fridge. And then you want to quantify that. Well, how far do you have to walk to the fridge? Well, I have to walk, you know, 20 feet. So let's put that on there. I have to walk 20 feet to the fridge. A problem is there's no white bread when I go to pull the bread. A problem is the bread is stale or there's only end pieces left. So starting with a problem is great idea. We do this uh, pretty much every time we're doing a value stream map and I forgot to bring it up. There you go. Thank you. Measure, measure, measure. Yes, make it quantifiable. Get as much information on the board as you can. So those are all the steps of creating a value stream map. Um, McKinley, we're, we're gonna zoom out just a little bit here. Okay. Sorry for the close up there, guys. So what you'll see here is the whiteboard is a mess, right? And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? 
zoom that back in a little bit. Some tools that we're using for this. Uh, fine tip Sharpie, one that you can open and close so it doesn't dry out. <clears throat> this is a great tool for writing on these notes so that you can actually read them. Uh, it's better than using a ballpoint pen, for example. A ballpoint pen is a lot, uh, oftentimes much harder to read. Okay, so now we're done. We've created our value stream map. What do we do with it? I'll leave it. It's not important. Just leave it on the wall. Just leave it on the wall. Wall decoration. Wallpaper. Or yeah. maybe not. The beautiful thing about a value stream map is that every single one of these pink stickies is now a future Kaizen event or improvement opportunity. So. I have dozens of pink stickies on my wall. What's my next green belt project? Well, I don't know. We can pick one. We can say, you know, right at the beginning of the process, we're constantly running out of white bread. Boom, I'm gonna pull this off and I'm going to turn this into my next green belt project. Or as we'll talk about here in a minute, we're gonna organize these problems in a, in a Pareto chart to say, well, what's the frequency of this happening right here so that we can hone in on those problems. Right, so we have a dozen problems. Which one is the biggest, the most frequent, the most painful, right? That's another great way to look at it. We'll show you how to sort those. We talked about that in the last training where we organize things by effort and impact. So if I have on my wall over here, some sort of an effort impact scale where this is how much effort it's going to take. This is the impact this project will have. And this is a high impact, low impact. This is a high effort, low effort. Well, anything that's low effort, high impact, this is my number one. So if I say, no white bread, that's easy. That's gonna be low effort to fix, have a high impact on our process. Put it right there, that's a great project to start on. If uh, you know walking to the fridge is gonna be a bigger problem because we can't really move the fridge. So that's gonna have a high impact, but it's gonna be a high effort. That's gonna go down here and be a lower priority. So the priorities are one, two, three, and four. Low effort, high impact is first. Low effort, low impact is second. Why? Because they're easy. So let's just do them. Let's get them done. Then high effort, high impact is going to be here. Got that one in the wrong place. And then high effort, low impact is this fourth quadrant. And this is the one where we, we very rarely do anything that's high effort, low impact. I mean, why would we do that? There's so many other opportunities. You know, why, why bother, right? So these pink stickies are your idea funnel for your future projects. Very, very simple, okay? So put those right back. Your mission, once you've created a value stream map, is really fun. You and your team can keep it hanging on the wall. Hopefully you can find a wall space to put this on. If not, make it electronically. Put it on the wall and you and your team get together every morning in your morning meeting. And what do you do in your, in your team meeting before you start the day? Let's look at our value stream map. What problems are we gonna solve this week? I think we should solve this one, great. You grab it as a team, prioritize it, and boom, away you go. You're now solving problems on a regular basis, all from this beautiful, messy tool called your value stream map. Pract almost nothing more practical than just having a whiteboard on wheels sometimes to take it right out because you can move this around. So it's a very, very uh, great tool to have. It's like a hundred bucks. What do the guys say on YouTube all the time? You'll find a link to this product in the description. Below. <laughs> I don't know if we'll do that. But we should. Yeah, we're not sponsoring the links. We're, we're not missing, sponsoring we're, we're rolling whiteboards. Yeah, we really are. Dang it. Ryan and Sadro's whiteboards. Yeah. Yes, future business idea. Here we go. Okay, so some tools to help you out. There's a data collection sheet. At the end of this class on your Teachable account, we will upload all of these Excel templates that you can use to print. So we'll have the file available and you can pull it up and you can print. So this is the value stream map data collection tool. And you can see it, it gives you a place to list your process steps, list the amount of time each step takes. Um, is it, are there any yield issues at that step? What waste do we see? And then the most important part is taking notes, right? What are the notes that we can, uh, that we observe when we're at the Gemba watching this process happen, okay? So really simple form for collecting your data when you're at the Gemba. This slide's a nice reminder, yellow sticky notes are for the, all the information about the process, you can put those on the yellow sticky notes, and then you can use the red sticky notes to capture the problem, okay? So as Ryan was saying before, 
very simple words like uh, yesterday's work, you know, daily production schedule, yesterday's work. You know, in the moment, that might sound like you understand what the problem is, but it's much better if you can say scheduling releases a daily schedule to production at nine o'clock. And the problem is the schedule doesn't take it into account the work that we did from yesterday that we didn't complete. So much better, much more clear. Everybody understands what's really going on. Some common symbols for value stream mapping, the push process, the inventory that we showed you, symbols for operators, electronic information, push and pull, supermarkets, which is just another way of showing inventory that's actually planned inventory, not miscellaneous inventory that's laying around, and then gaps or starbursts. So before, uh, if you're not doing this using pink sticky notes, you can take your pen and say, this is a big problem put a little starburst by it. So a lot of times you'll help me hear me refer to problems as starburst. I'll say, hey, let's go look at the starburst. That's because I say, let's go look at this problem we're trying to solve. Here's another tip. If you're working with a team member who loves to draw on the board, like me, make sure you put them on the board because they will have more fun than anybody else and just being able to illustrate away. Absolutely. Okay. No, we're good. No, we're, we're great. Oh, here's a good messy one. Okay, so how do we take what we just did and make it into a swim lane diagram? Well, that's super easy. McKinley, will you zoom in for us? Yeah. So over here on the left-hand side, let's say we wanted to take the same process and turn it into a swim lane. Well, a swim lane just means that we've got a swim lane across the board for everybody who does a job in this process. So in this case, we have one department, which we'll call mom. Mom department. Mom department. She's the one that's going to go assemble all the items. And we'll just make a nice little swim lane for mom here. So because we have so much waste down below, we'll make a swim lane across. Okay. And then down below, we're going to make another swim lane for sister we've got the older sister she's going to do some work and then down below we have the customer which in this case is my son the who's ordering the peanut four-year-old version of son the four-year-old version of my son who's now a big 18 year old and uh, we're going to create a swim lane for the sister and a swim lane for the son Okay, for the customer. In, the, in your case, this might be the maintenance team and the engineering department and the manufacturing team or the purchasing person and the scheduler and the supplier, right? So you're creating a category for all of these folks. And then you're simply saying, what work does, do they do? Well, mom gets the bread. And then after mom gets the bread, sister's getting the jam type, pulling it from the fridge. And then mom's getting the knife. So our flow now looks like this. We go down, we go across, we go back up. You can start to see that this might get a little bit messy. And then my son says, no, I didn't want the seedy bread. I wanted the white bread. So now all of a sudden there's another step in here where we're getting feedback from the son, which is uh, he changes order. Oh goodness, that would never happen. He changes the order on us midstream. I didn't want strawberry jam i wanted oh. raspberry jam oh so he changes the order on us midstream here trouble trouble and now we've got multiple handoffs and this is the beauty of doing your value stream app as a swim lane every time there's a handoff every time the process crosses a swim lane this is an opportunity for delay, and it's an opportunity for error or defect. Okay, so right now I've got one, two, three places where there's a handoff, and every time that handoff happens, man, that, you can make a mistake. It's a real challenge. In fact, in many of your processes, McKinley, can you wipe that back in? In many, many of your processes, you'll see. Uh, the inspection point often is one of these uh, Hannah's, you know, again, going back to a project we worked on recently, there was literally a week to 10 days worth of extra customer waiting time simply because 
they uh, the process was waiting for an inspector to come to make sure that everything was done correctly. That's a, a typical handoff, and that was just creating an immense amount of waste in the process. Absolutely. So when should we use a swim lane as opposed to a regular value stream map? If you are in an office environment where you are dealing with electronic data, information, paperwork, forms, a swim lane diagram is essential because most of the waste you're going to see in your process is probably either complexity of doing the job or the handoff. And so you want to show all the handoffs between different departments. And the goal is to minimize those. So if you look at the at our PowerPoint screen here, you can see this is an example of a process before it. You can see how many starbursts are there. In other words, how many handoffs are there on the screen? Well, there's one, two, three, four handoffs and all of these steps. If we go to our after picture, here we can see we've simplified the process down and now we went from four handoffs to three handoffs. Now it doesn't seem like a lot, but that's a 25% reduction in the chance for delays and errors. So that's a really big deal. And the swim lane diagram helps you understand the complexity, particularly in those electronic informational processes. Okay. So a little tip, guys. Sorry, when we go to the whiteboard and you want to see us big, right, you can take the window of us and you can expand it or pin it in the Zoom call. So um, anyway, that's something that we can do here is we can expand that video. I don't know if we did that while we were working on it. We're, did, Yes, yeah, so we want to make that video as big as possible because I don't think anybody was able to see too much of what we were just doing, unfortunately. Um, yeah, maybe we make it bigger so we can make it full screen there, lots of people can see. So that that would allow them on our yeah, keep going. Let, let's go back to here. I, I if you guys are I, you guys can either pin our screen to make it big or in the future what we'll do is we'll we'll have mckinley blow up the screen that we want you to be paying attention to which sometimes is us and sometimes is the, uh, the slide so in this case now hopefully you've got this you can zoom in you've got it so now you can see kind of what we've done here we've created a mom a sister and a customer swim lane and then mom's first step is gets the bread. Then she says to the sister, go get the jam, pull the jam, get the type of jam from your brother, pull the jam from the fridge, get the knife, changes orders. We're just showing the flow passing from one person or one team to the next person or team. Okay. So if you didn't blow us up on your own screen, apologize for that in the future, we'll do that on our side and make it a little bit bigger and a little bit easier. Again, you can see it's a mess, right? My handwriting is not, my handwriting is not the best. Doesn't matter, whoever's doing it, this isn't pretty. This is just getting to the waste, getting to the root cause. Okay, we'll go back to the slides now. Excellent. So we've learned about basic value stream mapping We've learned about swim lane diagrams. The next type of diagram we're going to learn about is called a spaghetti diagram. So a spaghetti diagram is mapping the motion of the product through the process or the motion of the operator through the process. So on the screen here, you can see an example of a factory that I was working in. And you can see that the material was coming from this big warehouse over here, the big green warehouse. Here. Oh, yes. Hold on. Alex has a question. Um, could a handoff be good if there are clear procedures, if there are none, or still potential for error? Um, yeah. What do you think? Any handoff is a potential for error, but some handoffs work extremely well, especially if you've standardized that handoff. And that's part of what we're trying to help you be able to document is to say, well, you know, is this process a problem or is it not a problem? Yeah. Yeah, a handoff is just a risk, but we, we recognize that in a lot of processes, you're going to have handoffs. There's, there's no way around it. Things have to go from one department to another, one person to another. That's just common. So 
if you have to do a handoff, like you said, um, make sure there's clear procedures. People are trained to them, understand them. And then can we mistake proof that as, as much as possible? We're going to learn about mistake proofing in two sessions time from now when we get into the improved phase. We'll dive deep into how to mistake proof processes. And we have some uh, good examples of how to do handoffs in a mistake proof way um, in that in those slides. Yep. So, yeah, we'll definitely get there. Great question. Um, I should pause here, I guess, before we move on. So thank you for interrupting with a great question. Um, what other questions do you have about creating either a value stream map or a swim lane version of a value stream map? Questions, thoughts, ideas? Is this something you guys have done before? And it's like, oh yeah, no, no problem. We've done this before. Or is this something that you think that you could do? Like, uh, you know, it seems straightforward or does it seem like uh, that it might be complicated and you have some questions. Okay. No questions popping up immediately. That either means one, we did a great job explaining it. Or everybody's asleep. Or they're like, yeah, the heck with it, you know, we don't know. We hope we did a good job explaining. It is fairly straightforward and it's a lot of fun. It's probably uh, the best activity you can do as part of your project because everybody starts to see all the waste. And if they didn't see the need for your green belt project before, they're going to see it after you do a value stream map. They're going to see all the, all the pink stickies and they're going to be like, wow, we've done a lot of work to do. Especially when you start measuring it and you look at it in terms of what's a value at a time and not value at a time. And, and now is the time to really be hard on that process. You know, don't, don't say, well, okay, I think that's value add. No, let's, let's really be honest. Is this, is this a change, does, does it change the form fitter function and does the customer want to pay for it? If it doesn't meet that criteria, it's not a value added activity. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So now we're going to move into a spaghetti diagram here and uh, some keys to making a spaghetti diagram. So we're looking for in a spaghetti diagram, where's transportation waste and motion waste, right? And they make for awesome before and after pictures. So the way you do a spaghetti diagram is you get your little, uh, you walk out onto the floor and you grab the part if you're trying to map out the motion of the part and you say, okay, I'm going to be the part. Where do I start? Well, I start in the warehouse. Okay, and then where do I go? Well, then I go over here to this inspection step where they check the part for quality before they send it to the factory. Okay, and then they group me over here with this kit and then I go all the way over here and then I, I'm out on the production floor and then I go over here to this station and then I go over here to this station. Then I go sit in inventory for a while and wait for the next step. And you just follow the part around and every time, every place it goes, you map it out on the process. So you're creating this flow electronically on a piece of paper with a pen, whatever it is that you want to do, just following the part through. You can do the same thing with people. You can say, okay, that's the operator. How much transportation waste do they have? How many miles do they walk every day? And we've talked to several people in several factories that say- They're proud of it. They're very hey, proud of it. I got my 10 miles in today. Yeah, they seriously will walk 10 miles in a day or more. And uh, just like, wow, that is an enormous amount of waste. Because when you're walking, you're typically not adding value, right? Unless you're an exercise uh, coach or something, maybe. But you're not actually, you're not adding value to the customer. And that's what matters. You're yeah. not changing form, fit, or function. The customer doesn't want to pay for you to walk 10 miles. Yeah, exactly. So we map it out. We follow the person. We follow the part. We draw it on a drawing. We calculate how many feet that is. And then to turn that into dollars, we simply say, well, how much time did that take? Well, if we're paying this person you know, 20 bucks an hour, and they spent two hours of their day walking, that's 40 bucks a day, Pretty five days a week. You know, that's a lot of money, a couple hundred bucks a week times 50 weeks a year. That's a lot of money we're wasting for everybody that does that job. And so you can very quickly turn transportation and motion waste into dollars just by how much time was spent uh, doing non-value added work. Which is why this measure phase is so critical instead of just jumping to the solutions. Let's really Put, uh, you know, put a measurement to what's going on here. Calculate it in terms of distance. Calculate it in terms of time. Calculate it in terms of dollars because that's part of you being able to tell the story about your project. You know, this is what it was like before and now this is what it's like after. So you're always looking for these ways to tell the story, the before and the after. Excellent. Okay. So you can see on the screen here, I've got the before spaghetti diagram. I've got the after spaghetti diagram. How many feet were reduced, right? About 50%. So we can say we had a 50% reduction in transportation or motion waste, which is excellent, right? Both of which are good things. Okay. That moves us on to the SIPOC diagram. Oh, that sounds, it sounds like such an ominous name. It is SIPOC. A, SIPOC. It's a great Ooh. name. 
So this is a Six Sigma tool. So if you're a pure lean Toyota production system person, you've never heard of a SIPOC and that's okay. Um, if you're a Six Sigma person, I've been to a lot of Six Sigma trainings when I was going through getting my certifications and they always would teach you the SIPOC. But what they never taught me was when the heck would I use this? Isn't it just another value stream map? Why is it different? When would I use it? Here's when you use a SIPOC diagram. You use a SIPOC diagram when you feel that the problem isn't in the process itself, but in the things that happen outside of the process. So if, for example, you think the biggest problems are with the parts and the materials and the information coming into your process, you would map it out using a SIPOC. If you think the biggest problems are after when the when the parts get to the customer, the information gets to the customer on their end, you would use a SIPOC. A SIPOC is not useful for if you're trying to dig into the actual process problem. We have that already with a value stream map or a swim lane diagram. So if you're doing a swim lane diagram, value stream map, you already know how to dig into the process and solve the problem. Now, what does SIPOC stand for that ominous Funny word. Funny word. It is funny sounding. So S is for suppliers. I is for inputs. P is for process. O is for outputs. And C is for the customer. What we're doing in a SIPOC diagram is we're listing what is the process that we do. So these are the steps to create a SIPOC diagram. We're going to start out with what is the start of our process? What's the end of our process? And, and maybe a couple of big steps in the middle, but this really isn't a process mapping tool as much as it is an input output tool. If you've ever been in engineering, a SIPOC is the same thing as an IPO or input process output diagram, right? They made it a little fancier by adding suppliers and customers, but it's basically inputs, process, and outputs. So we start off with what signals the start and the end of the process? What are the main steps that happen in between? And then we're looking for what does the supplier give us? Those are the inputs. What do we produce? Those are the outputs. And who are the customers and their requirements for each? So let's go through how to build that. Here's an example here of our peanut butter and jelly. So if you guys can see this, the process starts when the customer, my son, places an order. Then we slice the bread, apply the peanut butter, apply the jelly, close the sandwich, and deliver it to the customer. Is that very detailed? No. Do we want it to be? Not really. We're going for big process steps here. We're not trying to find the waste in the process with the SIPOC. What we are trying to do is find the waste in the inputs and outputs. So then we go over to inputs. Well, in order to process the customer order, we need the order requirements, the quantity of sandwiches they want, the bread type, and the fill type, so the jam type. Okay, great. So those are all the inputs we need. Then we go to the inputs requirement column. And on that column, we have order must be complete, easy to read, and it must be submitted before the production cutoff. And then you'll notice the put the order in before the production cutoff is red. Why is it red? That's the waste. So we're highlighting, this is the input requirement that isn't being met. We require that the customer order in be in by 10 o'clock, but we always get orders at 10, 15 saying, hey, I know it's last minute. I wanna place this order for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's always 15 minutes late. And we try to squeeze in the order, which disrupts the whole, the whole system and it causes us a ton of waste. So we highlight that input requirement as a requirement that isn't being met. And, and who decides if that requirement's being met? Well, the process owner, the people that run that, that peanut butter jelly process, they get to decide which supplier inputs are not being met. So second example, next one down, the bread type. In order to slice the bread, we have to know the bread type, whether it's fresh bread, we have to have a cutting board, a knife and gloves. Our requirements for that step is that we need to know the quantity and type has to be easy to read. We have to have a sharp knife and there have to be gloves available. Well, gloves available is marked as red. Why? Because we always run out of gloves. There's never a replacement. We need more gloves, better inventory control on the gloves. Absolutely. Last thing I want to do is go walking around doing the waste of uh, motion and transportation, go find those gloves and bring those gloves back. Yep, exactly. So we listed our inputs. And then we're listing who are the suppliers of those inputs. So in this case, the customer gives us the quantity and the bread type they want. The grocery store, which is Harmon's, they give us the fresh bread and the sharp knife and the gloves. And then uh, Jiffy is the brand, the peanut butter that we get. So we list all of our suppliers. So we know who to go to when we say there's a problem. We say, hey, there's always a problem with these gloves running out. Would you please keep us in stock? And we work with the supplier to fix the problem. 
So that's the front end. The left side of the SIPOC is the front end of the SIPOC that you start with. What supplier problems do we have? And then we go and we flip it around and we say, well, then now let's look at the customer of our process, find out where our problems are at delivering to our customer. So let's go to the third one down. We apply the peanut butter. The output of that is a slice of bread with peanut butter on it. Okay, great, that makes sense. Who's the customer of that? Well, the production operator number three is the customer because they're the one that get that slice of bread and they put the jam on it. So what's the requirement? The peanut butter has to be evenly spread, has to go out to the edges, but not be too thick or too thin. Okay, well, why are those highlighted as red? Because we went to operator number three, our customer, and we said, hey, how's our peanut butter spreading skills? And operator three said, they're not very good. Sometimes your peanut butter is thick and thin. Sometimes you only put peanut butter in the middle. It doesn't go out to the edges. There's all sorts of problems with your peanut butter process. And since they told us that, now we have a couple of red starbursts to highlight of problems that we need to go solve. Okay, next one down. Apply the jelly. It needs to be out to the edges, not too thick or too thin. Close the sandwich. It needs to be delivered on time, matches the order. Deliver to customer. There should be a requirement there that says, deliver to the customer, jam side up. Do I get that wrong? If we deliver it with jam side down, it's going to be wrong. So it's got to be jam side up. Are we meeting that requirement? Yes or no. So this is how a SIPOC guides you through which inputs are problems, which of our deliverables or our outputs are problems that we can then go work on as part of our Greenbelt project. Okay. So questions on the SIPOC. We went through that relatively quickly because if you know how to create a value stream map, this is just looking at the inputs and outputs of every single step in that value stream map. Has anybody ever created one of these before? Have any of you ever done a SIPOC? You can go to your chat window and let us know. No, no. So let's see. Don't you normally just do this as part of a value stream map? Yeah. Good question. That is a good question. So how is this really different from a value stream map? Yeah. When I was first trained, I asked the same question. I said, why would I ever use a SIPOC? Why not just use a value stream map? And my answer was, good question. Why would I? 99% of the time, Ryan and I just do a value stream map. That's all we do. Now, I'll tell you when we have used a SIPOC and when it has been valuable to us is when we said, look, we're working on this project and the process doesn't seem to be able to operate properly because the inputs to the process are all messed up. In other words, we're focusing on this process, but the real process we need to focus on is somewhere outside uh, of that. Then we create a, a process map to understand what it is. Their time it comes in really handy is when you don't really know what your requirements are for either your inputs or your customer. Yeah. So, uh, boy, I can't tell you the number of times we've been working with a, uh, we're working with, for example, a, uh, uh, a customer, an R and D team with one of our clients, and the R and D team doesn't really know what their customer wants. They know they deliver reports and analysis and a bunch of data, but they don't really know if their customers like or use any of the information they're providing them. So we can do a sidebox to identify what are the what are the deliverables that we're giving the customer, and are those meeting our customers' requirements? Yes or no, and then highlighting those, and then as really as you know, maybe result in changes to our process, but really it's more of an exercise in understanding what requirements we don't know that aren't being met. So, yep, great question. Okay. Next question you should be asking is, is this going to be required for our green belt project and certification? The answer is not the SIPOC directly, but you definitely need a value stream map. I don't care if it's a swim lane, a uh, regular value stream map, a SIPOC diagram, you need some sort of a, a process map to identify waste as part of your Greenbelt project. If you're doing anything that is eliminating transportation or motion waste, we also want you to have a spaghetti diagram, right? If you are not in manufacturing or producing a physical product, but you're actually in a, uh, uh, an information or transactional role, um, any, any department like HR, marketing, sales, customer service, accounting. purchasing, accounting, finance. If you're in any of those departments, 
we want you to use a swim lane diagram for your value stream map to show all the handoffs of the information um, typically. So those are the requirements for getting your Greenbelt certification. All right. Well, congratulations. We're halfway through the training today and we're halfway through the material. So we have mapped our process. We understand the flow. We've captured a bunch of pink sticky notes with all the barriers and problems, waste, overburdening, variation. And next, we're going to dive into how do we collect the actual process data, the numbers behind the value stream app, right? How long does each step take? Where's the quality problems? What are the inputs and outputs? We're going to go figure all that out in the next section. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. When we come back, we're going to dive into gathering process data as part of the measure phase. Hold on one second. All right. Let's continue on with our measure phase. All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is going to be the second half of the measure phase where we talk about diving into our process data. We just wrapped up the value stream mapping phase of the measure, or the value stream mapping section of the measure phase where we mapped all of our processes using different tools. And now we have to go get process data. So why do we need data, Ryan? I, you know, without it, it's simply an opinion. It, if we if we don't have the data, we we just we get wrapped around the axle around all sorts of opinions, and the data cuts through those opinions. Yeah, absolutely does. So we might think we have a problem, we might not know how big the problem is. Uh, the data is going to help clarify for that for that. It's going to help clarify that for us, help us under know exactly where the problem is, how big the problem is, how frequently it happens, and we have some tools that we can use to go get that information. So. The trick here is to be curious. We need to know what's tripping us up and we need to put a number on it. And that's the whole point of this part of the measure phase. So I love Dr. Deming. He said, look, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So I don't know if you guys uh, have had this experience, but I've spent a lot of time in meetings arguing about something where no, none of us had any data but we all had a really strong opinion. And lots of opinions. Of, lots of opinions. Yep. I personally have lots of strong opinions. Uh, what? I do. I've never seen that before. No, it's true. Okay, I'll take your word for and it. So the question is, is do you have data to back it up, right? When somebody makes an argument. So I'll tell you one example. I was working at a company and me and the engineering manager got into a big fight because I wanted to create flow through the clean room, which meant no walls, no doors, just good flow. Mm. And I'm like, this is going to be brilliant. And so we were adding on to the clean room and the engineering manager said, no, the new addition to the clean room is going to have a different HVAC system managing the air quality. We can't have two HVAC systems managing the air quality with two rooms connected to each other. Just not going to work because, you know, it, you could have one different than the other. I don't know. Yeah. But I disagreed with him. We had a big argument. Neither of us had any data. Uh -huh. So he won because he was the engineer, engineering manager. He owned the room. Yep. So rightfully so. So we built a wall, we built the new clean room and the two were not connected. So my flow was terrible because I had to hand everything through a little window between oh, the two of them. And so it was rough. After a couple of weeks, we realized something that the particle count in the, either side of the clean room was different. And that by opening the door between the two, we could actually level it out and stabilize it so that the rooms were behaving equally and our measurements were passing our quality control. Checks. Wow. And so in the end, the data showed that, dang it, I would have been right had I had the data and said we didn't need a wall there. But uh, unfortunately, at that point, there was no way to improve the flow. We just ended up walking everything through the door. So, ah, well, you know, you know what? Go start with the data. That's what we need first, right? Okay. So how do we find out? where the real problems are in our process. Because in the measure phase, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for problems. Yeah. We're going to use an 80-20 rule. What's the 80-20 rule? Well, you know, the Pareto principle, what some of you know this as, simply says that that uh, if you if you want to understand what's going on in the process, look at 
you know, the, the 80% that's causing that is probably 20% of the actual number of things that are happening. So in other words, if you look at the, you know, a handful of, of errors uh, are causing a large part of the variation, overburdening and waste in your process. Yeah. So if you feel like you're overwhelmed from your value stream map and you have a hundred pink sticky notes, right? We just did value stream mapping. Every pink sticky note is a problem. With those 100 peak sticky notes, do we need to solve all of those to make our customer happier? This is not going to happen. And so we need, some, we need some way to organize it. Yeah, we need some way to filter it down. And so this is the, the Pareto principle. And Pareto was actually a guy, uh, it was a scientist, and he saw this behavior in nature where this 80-20 rule kept popping up. You know, like we only really need to solve maybe 20% of the problems, and that will take care of 80% of the pain that the customer is feeling. So... How do we go and get data for a Pareto? Uh, how do we find out? Well, we can use this very simple tool called the checklist. And this is an example of a hospital we were working with. And in the hospital, they have a list of all the reasons why the doctors can't discharge the patient by 11 o'clock in the morning. So you may not know this, but when you go to a hospital and you're admitted and they discharge you, they have some, some time measurements that they're keeping track of. And one is they want to schedule you to be discharged before 11 o'clock in the morning. And this wasn't happening. 50% of the time we need to be there. We were only getting, you know, 45, 46% of the time we were getting patients discharged by 11. And so I asked the doctors why. And they started, I said, they said, well, I don't know. We got lots of reasons. I said, well, which one's the biggest reason? Well, I don't know. Different doctors had different opinions. So we created a checklist. I said, every time you can't schedule a patient for discharge by 11, I want you to put a check mark on the list. And we did. And what we found out was you can see on the checklist, one of these has a really big bar on a big line it says the number one reason is the patient is not well enough to leave the hospital brilliant that's the number one reason well draw on that seems like it seems like a good example yes i will draw on that let's see if i can draw on that no it's not going to let me i go to draw mode red there we go now we're in drawing mode and, and as you can see as we pull this up you can see that a number of these are are pre uh, populated. So some of the ideas that the team came up with first, uh, we put on the you know top of the list, the, the pre-populated, but then there's space at the bottom, as you can see, to, to leave room for people to add things as they came up. I was going to draw on it for you folks, but it's just not happening today. This, uh, every time I touch the screen to draw, it just advances the slide. So there you go. If you can see, if you can zoom in on your slides there, you can see the number one with the most check marks. Now I said, no, we probably can't do anything about being well enough to leave. There's nothing we can do to fix that. So let's get that. Let's go to the number two problem. Well, the number two problem is we're busy with existing patients. Hmm. Is that a problem that we can fix? I think that, uh, that that's a problem we can fix. So what we did was we said, look, the doctors come in first thing in the morning, you know, it's 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. And the first thing they do is they go talk to all the patients. They go check on all the patients. Now, at the same time, they need to be scheduling patients that are ready to go to be discharged. But they're so busy rounding on all of their other patients that they don't have time to get to their computer to do the discharges. And so we said, hey, could we maybe when we get in the morning, just check on the one or two really critical patients and then go to the computer, discharge everybody that's supposed to leave, and then go back and finish checking on the rest of the patients. And by doing that, we can get more of our discharges out by 11 o'clock. Brilliant. So we implement the new process and we've solved or at least improved on the second largest problem on our Pareto. So this is something you guys can do today. You can literally, after this class, go out to your team and say, hey, what are the biggest problems that we have? Write them down. Put them on a sheet of paper, write down every problem the employees tell you they're having or your team is having. Post that on the wall and then say, okay, every time you have that problem, I want you to put a check mark by it. Or better yet, you can put the date. So this happened on April 19th, then April 20th, then again on April 20th, then April 21st. That way you can start to see over time uh, you know, when those check marks were made. And after a very short week, this list you, you have in front of you here for the hospital was one week's worth of data. That's it. In one or two weeks, you're gonna have so much data, you won't know what to do with it. And you'll just say, oh, wow, now we know what our top hitters are, the biggest problems are to go address. Really simple tool. What do you do with that data? Now we've got the tool. You can create a Pareto chart. Now this is a uh, also called a histogram. So if you uh, hear somebody say, you know, what you know, later we're going to learn about more statistics and we're going to learn about histograms, but it's just a bar chart. 
right? So a column chart in Excel. Yeah, it's just a way of organizing the numbers, essentially, so that we can understand the shape and the size of the numbers and what it looks like. Exactly. In this example here, we were looking at which department is causing us to have the slowest response time to getting a patient through the hospital. And it turns out the number one longest time was the lab, the number two was radiology, and number three was the doctors. We gathered that data, and then we charted it so people could visually see what the data was telling us. So on a Pareto chart, you have a couple of elements. You've got the problem area on the bottom. You've got the frequency, how often that problem occurs. But then you've got this blue line. Ryan, what does the blue line tell us? Well, you know, if we follow that line, it's going to show the cumulative percentage of what that problem is. And so another way of thinking about it is if we took this radiology block and, stuck and put it on top of the lab block right here, that line should go out to that 62.9 right here. So this is just keeping track of how we get to the 100%. And this is where the 80-20 rule comes in. So if we solve the problem with the lab, we solve the problem with radiology and we solve the problem with the doctors. What percentage of the pain that our customers are feeling have we solved? My goodness, look at that. 83.9%. 83 so our three problem areas account for 83% of the pain that the customers feel. Okay. And by the way, this is easy to do within Excel. Uh, there's also a number of statistical packages that will do this, but there's a very easy way of doing this. So there's uh, no reason not to collect the data and make this visible. Yeah, absolutely. No reason not to. So we're going to use a simple, in this case, this is an Excel sheet. We will again give you access to the Excel spreadsheet that has a Pareto already in it that you can use. And we'll upload that after the class today. And you can get it out on the account, the same account that you watch the videos from. So in this example, we're keeping track of how many times we're material short, we, how many times we have to rework parts, how many times we got the schedule wrong. And on the right-hand side, we're getting a little fancy here. We're not only keeping track of the occurrence, how frequently it happened, which is just counting the number of Xs, but we also have another column for severity. And the reason for that is something may occur all the time, but it's not really that severe, where something else occurs once in a while, and it's really severe, it has a really big impact. And so when we're trying to organize which problems to go and solve, it's helpful to know both the frequency and the severity or the number of occurrences and the severity. So what I do is I take the number of occurrences and the severity and I multiply those two together to get a, a risk of what we call a risk priority number or a priority number. And this helps us prioritize which one of those to go work on. So you can either just go by frequency, which is the Pareto chart, and, and go fix the problem that has the highest frequency or occurrences, or you can do this more sophisticated method where you're looking at the priority number. In this case, the highest number of occurrences is rework with 11, but the biggest problem because of severity is material short. So you see the priority number for material short comes out as 72, for rework comes out as 44, that tells us that even though it's not the highest frequency, that material short is potentially the first problem we should go and solve. You can also incorporate safety into the severity uh, matrix that as is well. That's an excellent idea. And, yeah. and, and think about it in terms of, you know, what's the potential if something were to go wrong, you know, and that, that will increase the severity index on this to say, man, we've really got to pay attention to this, even though it may not be as frequent as some of the others, but the possibility of someone losing their finger or something worse uh, you know, that could have a very dramatic impact on everybody involved, especially the, the, the person that happens to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So sometimes when you do a Pareto chart, you're going to get a long tail, which means you're going to have a lot of problems that happen very infrequently, right? Now, hopefully that long tail is something you can kind of, um, I don't want to say ignore, but it's not the first thing that you should work on, right? Now, once you've solved your top one, two, three items, then maybe you're like digging into that long tail and solving some of those smaller problems. But if you go back to your value stream app, you, you've, you've pulled off a couple of the big stickies. Now you've got a bunch of small stickies left. Are those still good projects to work on? You bet, because every single one of those problems on your Pareto is still a pain point either for your employees or your customers, for your team. Uh, and every one you eliminate just makes your process flow that much better. And that's what we're all about today. How right. do we improve the flow? Exactly. Right. Now, when you're looking at this Pareto diagram, also keep in mind that, that when you put the data together, you might find some of the columns make more sense to combine. 
from the sense that they may have common root causes. And so, you know, we've been in some scenarios where, where the, um, you know, uh, a product was, um, there was a defect on the product. And the only difference in the Pareto chart was a, uh, something that happened on one side of the product versus another side of the product. Uh, in some cases, that might actually be two separate things. In this case, there really weren't. They really had a very common root cause that it just happened to be uh, one side or the other. So think critically once you put this together and say, you know, what's, what does our gut tell us about how we've organized this data and do we need to take another crack at it? Absolutely. So what Ryan's saying, if you can look on the uh, chart, well, that doesn't work for me to walk that direction. No, Let's I think go the other way. that way. I'm going to go this way. These two problems right here, if those are really the same problem, you might combine them. And then that, what looks like a small bar might actually end up being like your number one or number two. Yeah. And we see that happen all the time. Yeah. Which brings up another interesting point. When you go create this checklist for your team, if you go put it out on the wall, you want to list as many of the problems that are known problems and issues and put them on the list. What you have to be careful of is at the bottom, you might leave blank spaces for other problems. What you never want to do is you never want to write other at the bottom of your checklist because that'll always be the biggest inevitably one. that will be the biggest one everybody will be like oh i had another problem day i don't see it on the list other other check check and at the end of the day what good does that do you you just have a big list of others other problems and we don't know how to fix them no because we don't know what they are so never write other or allow people to write other on your checklist always leave space you'll see at the bottom of my checklist here i left space intentionally for them to write in other problems but they had to explain what the problem was if they didn't see it on the list already and luckily, none of those other problems happen very frequently, which is why they're kind of down in that other bucket a little bit. But that's a, a, a key trick when you're creating these is make sure the information is actually going to be usable at the end of the day. OK, so quick exercise. I want you guys to grab a sheet of paper or if you have the, the slides on the paper in front of you from your handouts, I want you guys to think of all the problems that are in your area right now and list them out. So if you were to, to create that Pareto checklist right now today, what would it look like? So take a, take a minute here and just write down a list of things that you would put on your potential Pareto checklist. And as you can see on the chart, the, what we call the more improvement opportunities, you're simply looking oh, yeah. at these as ways why are to these, Why is this a list of problems? Because it's, well, the, the language we use actually does matter. And so sometimes we can have a lot of negative connotations around problem, problem, problem. And instead, if we look at this as an opportunity for improvement, then we then it becomes something that we actually want to see. We want to see those opportunities to improve. So the language does matter. So basically, if you hire Ryan to come help you with your project, you're going to get a Pareto that has a list of improvement opportunities. If you hire me to come work with your company, you're going to get a list of problems. And that's just how it is. Glass half full, glass half empty, you know, tomato, tomato. There you go. But improvement opportunities is actually the correct term because it is a problem, but it's a chance for us to improve. We got to keep it in a positive light so we don't weigh everybody down. That's right. Yeah, it really does matter. That's all we want to do. Okay, give you a couple minutes. While they're doing that, I'll find out why I can't write on it. They can write on it there. Yes. And then when I go to the big screen, I can just see that much. Big screen. Well, I have to draw there, huh? Draw oh, there we go. See? Just take somebody who's smarter than the software to figure it out. And if you want to put some of these in your in the uh, chat box as we come up, I'm, it'd be fun to share as well. So, yeah, we'll do that. One of those options should be the eraser at the end of the page. Would it too?
Okay. Go ahead and type in the chat window, if you don't mind, some of the improvement opportunities that we have here. Yep. Website does not pass UPC code to the ERP system, so we have to enter orders by hand. Ah, That's a great problem ooh, statement for a yeah. big project, that right? That is sweet. That sounds yeah. like a brutal that project. That is brutal. <laughs> Doing it all by hand. What's uh -huh. the point of a ERP system if you have to do it all by hand? Okay, great one. What other uh, ideas did you got for, for multiple potential problems, waste, and quality issues that you might want to count on a Pareto chart? Yeah. What are those improvement opportunities you're finding? Out of stock. Okay. That's one we come across a lot. Mm -hmm. So if your project is around, you know, production and you want to know what the biggest problem the, the production team runs into, you could list that. So out of stock, no FIFO, yeah, great first, one. First in, first out. If no you, first in, first out. Yep. Schedules constantly being changed due to material shortages. Ooh. Yep. That's, that's a familiar problem with a lot of companies that we work with. Yep. Broken dies and tools. Damage to worn equipment. Yeah, creating quality issues. Okay. Yeah. Unexpected absence. Huh. Capacity issues. Not having employees show up to work. That is the surest way. That's a things. major issue that a lot of companies are dealing with right don't now. Don't have actually. product, don't have people, not going to work. Yeah, that's tough. Missing orders and incomplete orders. Great to catch on that. That it's not just the missing, but the incomplete as well. We're not sending the right signals of what needs to get done. That's absolutely going to be a problem. All right. So nice job, guys. Love it. So again, your mission, if you want to start collecting all the problems in your process, leave a checklist out for your team and have them fill it out for the next week. Two weeks tops. That's all you need. Okay. That's easy. That should be it for the uh, Pareto principle here. Now, how do we take this to the next level? Because there's gathering data from our value stream map and there's gathering data from our Pareto checklist. Those are what we call gathering the voice of the process. Yeah. What is our process trying to tell us? It's broken. It's hurting. It's trying to tell us why. And we've just got to get that information. Those are great tools for that. <clears throat> now, there's other projects that can come from other areas. So... Voice of the business means how do we find out what our business needs us to work on? Could those be our greenbelt project, right? So um, what are our company's strategic objectives? What does our executive management team want to accomplish this year? What goals have they set for themselves or for the company? Exactly. Can our greenbelt project help facilitate those goals? I tell you what, if you wanna, if you wanna make somebody really happy, find out what your boss's uh, KPI or objective is for the year, and then go do a Greenbelt project that will help that help happen. Them meet it. Now, if you remember back on day one, when we were talking about defining the problem, when we talked about SMART goals, that R in SMART is related to. So is that project related to the strategic objectives that yep. you're trying to hit? So that that's you know one way to say, oh yeah, let's tie this back into the bigger picture that we're trying to hit. Yeah, absolutely. So voice of the business, go talk to your boss, your manager, your other peers, find out what's going on that you can work on as a project. Next one is the voice of the operator, right? So we talked about this, I think a little bit last time where we wanna fix what bugs you. And a lot of times that means starting with helping the operators or the team, you know, whoever your team is. It may not be a problem that affects the customer, but it definitely could affect your team. And why not use those as your first projects to go and solve? Because the more you make your team happy and make their life easier, the more they're going to be on board with this whole concept of continuously improving, and they're going to jump in on the future projects. Yeah, without question. In fact, if you remember the surgeon example that we keep talking about, if your, operate, your operators are your surgeons, they're the ones changing the form fitter function, doing something the customer wants to pay for. And so their voice, what's causing them pain, especially if it's something that they can't solve in their own space and it requires a bigger uh, approach, that's a great opportunity for a project. Yeah, it absolutely is. 
Okay, so go talk to your team in your morning huddles or your team huddles, team meetings. Um, put tick sheets out on the floor where they can list their problems and put check marks next to them. And basically, you know, go, go to the Gemba, go talk to your employees, spend time with them. Okay, and then the final one, which isn't really final, it's, it should be the first, is voice of the customer. What does our customer actually want from us? Yeah. Right. What expectations do they have that aren't being met? You know, I, when you deliver your products, they always come in three days. I wish they could get here in two. OK, great. That's fantastic. When I open the box, you know, the parts are always, you know, scrambled from the shipping process. I wish that they were in a you know, container so they weren't banged up. Fantastic. We can fix that. You know, every time I call, I have to call and check my bill because you guys don't invoice me correctly. Every month, the invoice is wrong. Great. Like, let's go talk to our customer, find out what they want. Now, I was implying that that's the end customer that we're delivering product to, but for most of you on the training, you may not directly interact with the end customer, but who do you interact with? Who's your customer? Well, that's the next person in the process that gets deliverables from you. So if you remember back to the SIPOC diagram from the measure phase, we listed our process and then we listed who's our customer. And then we, we said, what do we deliver to those customers? And you may have more than one. So for example, if I'm, um, you know, if I'm the marketing department, who's my customer? Well, my customer is the sales team that has to get new leads from our marketing efforts. It's the uh, production team. He needs to know if we're running a new marketing campaign that's going to double our, our demand. So they need to ramp up. It's our materials team who uh, needs to source all the materials to meet that demand from our big new marketing campaign. So as a marketing department, I have a bunch of customers or as we called them in the previous session, stakeholders, right? So you guys need to identify who your internal customers are for your company and go talk to them and say, how are we doing? And this is a scary conversation. It is. Right? Because Ryan and I are partners. We work together. He's one of my customers. I have to make sure that I'm doing a good job for him. And it's scary for me to say, hey, Ryan, how am I doing? Am I, you know, meeting your expectations? Am I giving you what you need when you need it? And now I'm terrified because Ryan might look at me and say, no. And at that point, what happens? Well, and the, the same, the re absolute reverse is exactly the, the same too, right? Because anytime that we, that we're in a relationship and trying to solve problems, we, you know, there, there's certainly things that are going to go wrong and certainly opportunities we have uh, to uh, to work out what those opportunities are, but but understanding that voice and really listening, because in reality, people just want to be heard. It's not like you necessarily you know have to solve that kind of problem right then and there. A lot of our customers understand that sometimes there are problems that we can't solve, but just listening to them uh, goes a long way. Yeah, it absolutely does. In fact, boy, you can really mend relationships within a company by going and spending time at the Gemba with your customer or your supplier. Uh, I think I gave the example of Joe in our last uh, training where Joe was, you know, factories were really frustrated with Joe. And so by going to That's the Gemba story. and we, we spending time with the factories, Joe, the materials guy and the factory managers were able to form relationships and talk things through and understand each other. You know, why is it so hard to get this done? And why is this so hard? And, and, and they respected each other. They had more empathy for each other. That all came from going to the Gemba and, and talking, right? And that's what we're promoting here. Go talk to as many people as you can. And every time you talk, make notes of all the problems. And instead of getting overwhelmed, say, those are problems. Those are improvement opportunities. Improvement opportunities. And now those improvement opportunities are going to go into an idea funnel, which is going to allow us to work on many, many projects throughout the year. Okay. So... How do we improve the way we go and collect that data? So if we're getting voice of the process, we can do an improvement Pareto. If we really want to get the voice of the process, we do our value stream map and review all of our improvement opportunities with our team. If we're get, gathering the voice of the, of the operator, we can go have operators submit ideas or, or pain points. But if we really want to do a good job, we're going to go and get our operators' ideas and go, go do a root cause analysis with them, find out really what is the root cause of what's happening. If we want to get voice of the business, we can look at our metrics and our KPIs, or we can go negotiate with our managers and say, what do you really want me to work on for my Greenbelt project? What would make the most difference to you? And we do this using a catch ball and Hoshu process, which you don't need to learn about. That's a deeper stuff for a deeper class. 
the voice of the customer. We can listen to anecdotal evidence and complaints that come in, or we can actually go get feedback from them and do surveys and solicit information from them directly. So that's how you can do a better job of getting all of the voices that you need to listen to for continuous improvement. Okay, so next we're going to jump into different types of data. So to understand our process, we need to get samples of data. And what do I mean by a sample? Wow, that is, you kind of like opening up that can of worms because, you know, some people will say, Hey, if you need a sample, the magic number is always 30, 30, 30, 30. If you need a sample, it's just 30, but that isn't always the case. So let's think about an example project here. I want to know what my yield is on my production line. Yeah. How many defects do I create? What's the percentage yield? How, how much data do I need to know that? That, see, this is a great conversation to unpackage because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of issues that you need to keep into uh, keep in mind. For example, if you're talking about pass fail, that's a one type of data. You're going to need more on that than if it was a continuous stream of data. So there's there's way, there's different ways of thinking about this that uh, we've got to unpackage. So we're going to talk to you at a very high level about sampling and data today. We're going to dive much deeper into this when we get to the analyze phase in the next session and the one after that. Yep. So, so just, just think of population as the whole and a sample as a subset. So if we have all the yield data from the last 10 years that we've been in business, do I need to have all of that data to understand my process? The answer is no, I don't really. I probably need the data from the last several weeks, even better if I have the last several months, right? So we're going to sample and collect some amount of data and that's what we call our sample from the bigger population, which is all the data. So you can think about it this way. If I need to know the average height of everybody in my company, and I have a thousand employees, so that I can buy everybody a t-shirt. And my t-shirt's gonna say, what in that process allowed that to happen? And that's right. a great idea for a t-shirt. It's gonna be an awesome t-shirt. So do I need to go get the size from every single employee? Well, no, I don't. I can take a sample of those employees. I can measure the height of 100 people, for example, and that will give me a good indication of the overall sizes for all 1,000 people in my company. So that's why we take samples, because it saves us time and it saves us money. We don't have to get as much data. In this step of the measure phase, you're going to go get data, and you have to figure out, well, how much data do I need, and what type of data am I going to collect? Okay, so let's answer the first question, or the second question first. What type of data do I need to go collect? It's important to understand that there are different types of data. So if I'm counting the number of defects, so every time a part comes off the line, I say, that's a defect, that's not a defect. Or, you know, you measure, you know, the number of times the ERP system doesn't allow uh, us to upload a file to it, to automatically load it. You know, we get a customer order and the ERP doesn't accept it. Well, accepted one, accepted two, oh, rejected one. We're counting that. That's called count data or proportion or percentage data. We're counting the number of times something failed and dividing it by the total number of parts that we made. We get a percentage or a count, also called a proportion, okay? So that's one type of data. The next type of data is pass-fail data. So did this pass? Yes, did this pass? No. So we're counting the number of passes and the number of fails, and we're getting, again, a proportion of number of passes to number of fails. Right? That's what we call binomial data because there's by, you know, there's two. Only of two. Only two. Okay. And we have another type of data, which is ordinal data, where things are in order, like this, this part is small, this one's medium, this one's large, right? This, this time we resolved the customer complaint quickly. This time we did it on average, and this time it took us a really long time. So things that are in order, right? Similar to that. There's data that is in categories that don't necessarily go in order, like small, medium, large is in order. But if I'm measuring hair color, brown, yellow, black, pink, right? Just different types. They're different types, but they're not in order. So that's what we call categorical data. Now, all of those are falling into one bucket of type of data, which is called discrete or attribute data. I like the word attribute better because yeah. it, an attribute means there's some attribute of what I'm looking at. Like this sticky note, is yellow. That is an attribute. It's also square. It's That's also square. Attribute. This one is crumbled and therefore failed. This one is straight and therefore passed. That's an attribute of these sticky notes. 
right? So attribute data falls into categories. Sometimes those categories are pass fail. Sometimes they're in order, but they're always in some sort of a category. And we usually deal with this type of data as percentages. So what percentage passed or failed? What percentage of all of the people had pink hair versus brown hair? Versus right? no hair. Versus no hair. That is an option. There's it no is an option. option. You know, all people are people too. <laughs> are they though? Oh, truly. <laughs> all right. The second category of data is what we call continuous data. And this is awesome because this is the kind of data you want. Hopefully you can find this kind of data in your process somewhere. What do I mean by continuous data? Well, it's continuous in that you can infinitely divide it. So if I'm measuring, you know, how tall is Ryan? I can measure that in infinite degrees. I can say he's five foot 10, five foot 10 and a half, five foot 10 point five, seven, six, nine, three, I, I can go as far as I want. I can measure him to a very small degree of height and it's, it's continuous or it's highly variable data, right? There's lots of varying degrees. It's not like brown hair, black hair, which is attribute. It's any degree in between brown and black, the degree of black hair that you have. Yep, so if you're using decimals in your data set, great. That's, that's gonna fall under this continuous yes. idea here. Now, why do we care? Well, we care because we're about to learn statistics. The next class you come to, we are going to require you to bring a laptop or have access to a computer so that you can do some statistics in Excel and in some other statistical software that, that we're going to introduce you to. Don't panic. Very straightforward. We'll walk you through this step by step. We will. We'll make it very easy for you or as easy as it can. The concepts take a little while, hopefully bring back some memories. I was actually working with my 12-year-old uh, son last night on some math homework where he's learning about mean, median, mode, range. Love it. Interquartile range. Love it. Oh, it's brilliant. brilliant he's getting stuff. a good education. He's in sixth grade. I'm I like, good grief. I teach this stuff in our Six Sigma courses to grown men and women, and you're learning it in sixth grade. So it was, it was actually really cool. He's not nearly as interested in it as I am. Shockingly. And unless, unless you could apply it to baseball, then he would be extremely interested in it. That's what we got to do. We're going to yeah. turn this into a baseball. It's all going to be baseball conversations. Then he's going to be all over it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So why do we care? Because we can do more statistics on continuously variable data. Now, here's the good news. If you have count data, like the percentage of pass fails or the number of defects, you can transform that into continuous data by dividing anything by time because time is infinitely variable. So you can say, how many defects did we have per minute, per hour, per day, right? And by dividing it by time, you've transformed that number into a continuous number with a decimal that you can then do some really awesome statistics. Yep, on. so it's infinitely divisible. You're in great shape. You're gonna have lots of decimals and that's good. Now, if you can't, if you just have pass-fail data, for example, we can still work with that data. We can still do statistics on it. Yep. It just requires us to have a lot more data. It does, and it requires a different set of statistical calculations. That, that's why it's kind of important at this stage just to wrap our head around these two types of things because it, the statistics demand uh, different ways of approaching the problem. So that's why we're trying to bring it and put it up front here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now that you've had a crash course in different types of data, we want to actually walk through a process of going and collecting that data. To do that, we're gonna create a measurement plan. A measurement plan just means that before we went to the Gemba to go get a bunch of data, we actually sat down and thought about it. What, what information do we really need? How are we gonna get it? So here's the steps. What do I wanna know? Which process am I gonna to go to the Gemba on? What type of data do I wanna collect? Pass fail data or continuous data? And obviously the answer is, continuous data, right? We want more highly variable data, decimal points, right? How am I gonna collect it? And most importantly, what am I gonna do with that data? And then who needs to be involved in collecting that data, okay? I'll give you an example. So we went out to a production line and we said, we wanna know how often the operators have to rework a part. So we have the operators keep track of how often they wanna rework a part and we gathered all that data and we got a list of how often they want to rework the part. So I'm going to jump over to my screen and I'll show you an example of what, what we might have gotten here. So, you know, on a, oops, my basic slide. This is the data that we got from them. Come on, PowerPoint, you can do it. 
Or maybe you can't. Maybe it's just going to freeze up on me. Thinking hard. It's, uh, it's struggling. Seriously. Never works when you want it to. No. So Monday, Monday we had 12 parts that were we had to rework. And on Tuesday, we had 16 parts. And on Wednesday, we had 19 parts. That seems like good data, right? But then we need to ask the question, well, what do we want to do with it? And that's when we had a big aha moment. Oh, shoot. We don't know which parts they had to rework. Did they have to rework the front of the part, the back of the part, the side of the part? We don't know the location of where that rework was happening. We don't know if all 19 parts reworked were on the front of the part or if they were all on the back or if it was a mixture thereof. Shoot, our data isn't really what we needed. And now what do we got to go do? No. Go back and collect it again. That's right. And we got to say, no, what we really need to know is for the part, was it on the front? Was it on the back? Was it on the left? Was it on the right? Where so we had a, part? a defect in our process. Yeah, we're collecting data, but it isn't the data that we actually need or want, right? The other thing we start realizing, we don't know what time of day. Was it the morning shift or the night shift that was having the most defects? Did it, was it affected by, you know, they had defects right after they came back from lunch and they, you know, were tired or, you know, had, you know, jelly all over their hands from all the peanut butter sandwiches they were eating. That would be tough. It would be terrible. Yeah. So there's all sorts of like information that we realized that we needed that we weren't collecting. And that's why you create a measurement plan, because otherwise you'll go get a bunch of data and then realize, I, I don't know what to do with this. It. not really what I wanted. Right. So simply about asking the right questions. What what questions? What is it that you want to find out? So let's do a measurement plan example. So in this example, let me change my display settings. In this example, there is some data that I want to collect. I want to know what process step is causing my defects, how frequent they are, and what are the different types of errors. So the data I want to collect is first my process steps. It's discrete data, and I'm going to use uh, my value stream map for that and my process flow. That's where that data is going to come from. Okay, Who's responsible? I am method of data collection going on a Gemba walk. Great. I know how to get that. Now I want to know the number of defects at each step. To do that, I'm going to count them. The units on that, units is like, you know, am I measuring feet? Am I measuring time, distance, weight? Um, DPU, defects per unit. That's what I'm collecting. Where's the source of that data? It's coming from a database. We already collected somewhere. Oh, great. I don't have to do a tick sheet. I can just go to the database. Yep. All right. I'm responsible for getting it. Status in progress. Next is defect types. I, I want to know what types of defects we're getting. I want to count those types of defects. I want to know the number of defects of each type. For that, I'm going to put a Pareto spreadsheet out there because we don't have that in a database already. So this is where I'm putting a tick sheet out there, asking my employees to put a tick mark on. Next one down, who does the process steps? I'm going to put their names on a value stream map and ask their supervisor to confirm who does what. And I'm going to go to the Gemba to collect that data. Finally, what's the cycle time at each step? I want to know uh, how fast each step is. So that's continuous data because it's time-based. How many seconds per unit? That's what I want to know. Where am I going to get that data? Well, it already is in the production database. Brilliant. I can go get that and, and download that data, and I'm responsible for that. So what I've done here is I've just thought through all the different types of data that I'm going to need to analyze this process and where to go collect them. Now, this is a, an example that has five different types of data, but you may only have one. You may say, you know what? Our project's about improving yield. Before we go change anything, I need to know what our current yield is. Does that data exist in a database? If it does, brilliant, use it. If it doesn't, you're gonna to have to put a paper tick sheet or some other method of collecting that data out on the production floor and have your employees uh, write it down and, and, and add that data so that you can use it. Okay. Last section, and then we're gonna dive into how you guys can start to track this electronically and get you guys going on your projects. So. Measurement system gauge R&R. &R. We're actually at the top of the hour. Yes. Let's take a short break. Let's do take a break. Let's take a short break. Another quick 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll do gauge R&R &R, and we'll do, uh, and then we'll dive into how to track your projects using KPI Fire software and how to get your project off the ground through the define and measure phase 
so that we can get you going by this time next week and get you, you know, well on your way. So short break, we'll be right back. All right. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Hey, we're going to do a, a real quick training. We had somebody text in that uh, they were struggling to see the screen behind us. If the view you're seeing right now, which is me, Ryan, and the screen behind us is all you're seeing, that's not what you should be looking at. So I want to show you how you can do a side-by-side -side view. So in Zoom, you're in charge of your screen. And up here in the top, there's a view button. Now there's an infinite number of state girls and Ryan's. Yes, right we're now. just going back into infinity here, but you can change that. When I share my screen, there's going to be a side by side view. And that's going to put us as a little box on the side and then the screen that I'm sharing a, on the other side of the window. And you can make that screen as big as you want. So if you've only been seeing us with the screen behind us this entire time or during the sessions, I'm truly sorry. Um, you have control over that on your end. That's not something we have control over. So all you need to do is click the view side by side and then stretch the, the screen, the PowerPoint presentation that we're presenting to make it as big as you want. You can make a full screen, you can hide us so you don't have to look at us, whatever you wanna do, uh, you can control that on your end. So let's try it again, make sure everybody's uh, able to see that. So I'm gonna share my screen again. And now you should see the PowerPoint presentation and then maybe us on the side, depending on what view you've selected. Then what you can go do is go into Zoom and select view uh, side by side, and then you can control how big or small you want us. You know, maybe improve the quality of the training just by minimizing Ryan and I all together. Probably would be good. Probably, you know. Just kidding. Hmm. Oh. Or we can go back to that infinite view and you can watch, you know, the handoff with all the hand motions. You can see them, you know, go to the next stage row, to the next stage row, to the next stage, and you can calculate all of the uh, handoffs that are going on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> we're going to dive into gauge R&R, &R, and this is a subject where we're analyzing how good is our measurement system. We just created a measurement plan. We just gathered all the data. The question we want to answer is, can we trust that data or is that data fundamentally wrong and inaccurate, which could you know, lead us to go work on a problem or do something that we maybe shouldn't even have done? That's right. So how do we uh, do that? I'm going to give you, do a quick exercise here. Um, count the Fs. So I'm going to give you guys 60 seconds here to count the Fs. Actually, I'm not even going to give you 60 seconds. How much time am I going to give you? Let's go 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Let me start my stopwatch here. 30 seconds starting right now. Ready, set, go. Count the number of Fs in this sentence, paragraph. There's a lot. There we go. The alarm has gone off. So how many Fs were there in that paragraph? Type them in the window. What's your guess? 37. 37. 44. 42. 42. Nice. 44. So we got 37 all the way up to 44 now. OK, another 44. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else? Throw your hat in the ring. 42, the winner gets a prize. What are you going to give him, Brian? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know either, but you're going to give him something. Ryan's going to give you something. Oh, I just love when he volunteers me to do something. Yeah, absolutely. Ryan's good for It's him. like the story of his life. See, Ryan's what can good for Ryan a gift. Do? What can Ryan do for you? That's, that's my that's model. That's model. Absolutely. Okay, what if I give you a little bit more time? Let's try again. So everybody has their number. Write down your before number. This time I'm going to give you a whole 60 seconds. Ready? Set go. Let's see if the response changes. 60 seconds on your marks. Get set go. 
60 seconds on the clock. What's your guess, Ryan? Working on it. How many Fs are in there? All right, I'm at a disadvantage because I already know the answer. Type in your numbers second round. Oh, we got a 47 now, 45 numbers are going up. 47, 45, 47, uh, completely different, 46. Wow. 46, so dramatic difference. The second time we measured 48, we have a new high, a new, new high 48, 47. Nice. What's the difference? So first time we measured, and the second time we measured, we're getting dramatically different answers. Different different answers. answers. And not only that, but different people are getting different answers. Goodness. Aren't we all rational people? Aren't we all intelligent? I think we all should be able to do the exact same thing. Why is it that you and I are getting different answers and I they're getting know. different answers? Everybody's getting different answers. This isn't good for our measurement system. So obviously, since we're all smart, intelligent, hardworking people, it's not us. The process must be changing. That paragraph is constantly shifting. Episodes. Must be, must be. I think, I think. Could be us, that's the problem. No, I think you've probably put another paragraph up there or yeah, something. That's right. So in a measurement system analysis, we realize that the way we measure a process introduces variation, which we know variation is bad. We don't want variation. But it's pretty simple to see that even on something as simple as counting letters that we're all familiar with, there's variation in the process. So when we go measure our value stream app, two people might measure it differently, right? We go collect data, two shifts, two teams might measure it differently. Um, so we need to recognize that, right? So how many are there? Let me, let me pull check my out. notes here. I want to make sure I got this right here. I didn't. Uh, so 37 is the number I'm going with. 37. So boy, I, I don't have the answer right in front of me, but I believe the answer was 47. So, uh, um, I had that in my notes, but then I, I saved my slide deck. It's a new slide deck, apparently. I must just have fallen it in out there. there. It must fall now. So when we look at our measurement system, there's a couple of things that introduce variation. One is the parts that introduce variation. The other is the operators. So the third thing is then the measurement system itself. So what we want to do is understand how much variation is caused by the parts we're measuring versus the person versus the measurement system. So if I'm using a ruler, for example, to measure something. That ruler is going to introduce some variation. Me reading the ruler is going to introduce variation. And then, of course, whatever I'm measuring has variation. So, for example, if I measure... Oh, thank you. If I'm measuring two pens, are they the same? Well, if I just look at them, they sure look like they're the same. Well, now, what if we take a ruler to them? The ruler still says they're about the same, but it's got these really small marks on. Could one be slightly different? Actually, yes. This is 12.4. You're holding it. And this one shows us 12.6. But it's not going down to the bottom. You're, you're, you're saying I messed some, it up? You're introducing variability in the variation. process. So this is the part. This is the measurement system. And I am the operator. And those are the three areas that can cause variation. So what are we looking for? We're looking for, can we repeat the process? So when the same operator performs the same measurement a second time, do they get the same answer? So if I measured that same pen twice, would I get the same answer? That's the question. I don't know. And then reproducibility, which means if I measure the pen and then Ryan measures the pen, are we getting the same answer? Get it? We don't know, right? The degree to which you can repeat and reproduce your measurements shows you how good your measurement system is. So why do we do it? We need to answer a few questions. Do our operators bias the measurement? Do our operators agree with each other? The operator meaning the person doing the measurement, right? What percentage of the variation is caused by me, the measurement system, or the part? How small of a process change can we detect? 
We're going to dive deep into this in the analyze phase and the improve phase come in the coming weeks. But in other words, if I want to measure this to within a half an inch, yeah, we can probably do that pretty well. Yep. But what if I want to measure this down to a micrometer? Oh, it's getting that, better. That might require a better measurement system than my ruler here. So how good your measurement system is it depends on how small of a change in your process you need to detect, okay? So those are the key questions. Examples, um, employee satisfaction was measured by the team's boss and an outside consultant. The result of the interviews were very different. When the team's boss interviewed the team, they said their satisfaction, he said their satisfaction was wonderful. When the outside consultant measured the team's satisfaction, the results came back that they were miserable. What could cause those two completely different results in the measurement system? It's an excellent question. What do you guys think? Why did the consultant and the boss get two different answers for the employee satisfaction? Go ahead and put your thoughts in the chat. Bias, caused by what? What caused the bias and how fear. was the bias? Fear. Interesting. What were they afraid of? People don't want to lose their job. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant, right? That's exactly right. Now, yeah. these are these are made up examples, guys. Yeah, these, these interpretations are, of, uh, of answers received and uh, more honest, with, more the honest with the consultant. Okay. Yeah, these are not made up scenarios. So we actually have this ha have this happen where we were working with a hospital and the, the CEO was going around doing the surveys and nobody was giving the CEO the right answer. You know, everything was good. We don't want to tell you our problems. They were hiding all their problems and complaints because they didn't want to lose their jobs. And then we went in and we said, well, let's make the survey anonymous. Even making it anonymous didn't work because they didn't trust that it was truly anonymous. Like they, ah, they're telling us it's anonymous, but but it's really it's not. real. They really know who I am, and they're going to track it. They can guess just by my answers. So we had to make a form where people could fill it out with no identifiers on it, so that we could gather the data without any bias, so they wouldn't hold back and give us the wrong answer. So you got to think of that when you go out to the operators on the line on your gamble walk. If it's your first time there, or you're the boss, and you're asking them, "Hey, what's wrong?" They might not give you all the answers. Your measurement system is fundamentally biased toward, you know, protection. Absolutely. Keeping my job safe, right? So there's a gap between two rollers on the glue machine. This is when I was at Purple Mattress and I was uh, running the manufacturing line out there. And there's these glue machines with these big rollers and they have a gap in between that allows a certain amount of glue between them. And they had to stay at this certain gap. Well, one operator on one shift would measure the gap and say it's just right. And the other operator would say, oh, the gap's off. And they would go adjust it. And then we get variation in our process. Well, why did the gap change? Well, because the two operators used the same measurement tool. They had the same caliper, but they were using it differently. They actually changed the way that they held it and put it in the machine to measure the gap. And therefore, the gap showed one employee that it needed adjustment. And the other one said it was fine. Um, green belt training class, uh, time to paper helicopter falling to the ground. This is an exercise we do in the black belt training, actually. Um, if I measured that with my iPhone versus my Android, the time was different. Why? Well, the measurement system was actually different. So we're not going to teach you guys how to do a gauge r, &R for Greenbelt. It's not required to get your certification. But however, if you think that your data may not be accurate or that you were tracking your defects on one shift, with the tick, uh, tick sheet and then your your second shift was tracking the defects and there's a huge difference like one is at like 80 percent yield and one's at 99 percent yield and you're like hold on there's no way that one shift mm -hmm. is that much better than the other you might have a measurement system problem and in that case we want to do a measurement system analysis so at that point you're going to reach out to ryan and i and we will show you how to do that or you can go into the black belt training and and suffer through that that with us a little bit more yeah, it's actually it's not that bad, but we it's do want to really we do want to introduce you to the concept because uh, if you if you get into this area, there are some great tools that can that can help decipher this, and so you can actually see you know what is a problem and what is not a problem. Yeah. That that's what you're trying to pick apart. So this is Minitab. It's a statistical software that you can purchase, um, and it will show you if there is 
a variation caused by your measurement system. This is a good example. This is what you want to see. And what you'll see here is the part variation, part to part variation is very big compared to the gauge r, &R or the measure, measurement system of repeatability and reproducibility. In other words, the variation caused by the operator and the measurement system is very small compared to the amount of variation in the parts. And there's other areas here where you can see, is there bias between operators? Is there bias between parts? Um, are there interactions happening between parts and operators? Um, so there's uh, a lot of other information packed in here, but really what you need to know is, is my measurement system causing a significant amount of variation in what I'm measuring, yes or no? Okay. So things to look for, bias, repeatability, stability, and again, discrimination, which means how small of a change is our measurement system capable of measuring. We're going to dive deep into this, but for example, I want to know if my throughput has improved from making 100 units an hour to now making 120 units an hour. Can my measurement system really measure that? And you may say, say well, that's obvious. We can, we can definitely measure that. But in reality, it depends on how much data you have, how big of a sample of data you've taken to know if there's really been a change from 100 units an hour to 200. I improved my yield of my process. I want to know if I went from 90% yield to 95% yield. Well, you might think that I can just get a couple data points and know that hey, it improved, but really it depends on how big of a sample we have, if we can detect that shift from 90 to 95% yield. So we'll dive into sample sizing in the analyze phase. Um, uh, in, in the future weeks. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of that, that is the end of the measure phase. So we're going to review and then we're going to show you how to do everything we talked about and get your continuous improvement program started using software in just two seconds here. But before we do that, while I do that, what questions do you have on the measure phase and the two components of it, which are value stream mapping and process data? Ryan will answer those questions while I pull up the next step in our training. You saw it right there. He just volunteered me again. He's very good at it. I am good at that. Yep. You know, it's good to have skills. Yeah, so questions. What questions do you have so far on uh, what we've talked about on the measure, on the measure phase? All right. I think we must have covered it well. Okay. Either that or everybody's lost. It's going to be one of the two. Okay. All right, guys. So here's what we're going to do next. We're going to kick off your project. So if you know what your project is, great. If you don't, you can start by saying, what is my process? Go do your value stream map, and then your big sticky notes will be, uh, one or two of those might be your project. So I want to show you the deliverables for the project. And in fact, do we want to, we do we go through the garage door example in the last training? We didn't, did we? Uh, no. Not for this class. Um, I don't believe. I don't think so, no. I don't believe we did. Maybe we should. But um, let's let's go through the report out template here, and we'll show you guys what a good project report out looks like. Again, we showed you this last time we went through the training, but this is a reminder of what the deliverable is for your green belt certification. You're going to fill out this project report out, which is in your slides, and uh, we'll also upload just this PowerPoint so you can fill it out and make it available to you. So again, these files are going to be available to you. We'll send you an email with a link. Okay. So uh, the project title is the first step of the report out, followed by the define phase. In the define phase, it reminds you in the, in the PowerPoint what you're supposed to do. Project charter stakeholder analysis. This is the project charter. You're going to fill out this project charter in the slide deck as part of your PowerPoint presentation. And we're also going to have you fill it out electronically in the software that's online so that Ryan and I can keep track of your project remotely while you're working on it. So there's two things, the PowerPoint 
and the software. I'm showing you the PowerPoint right now, then I'll show you the software next, okay? So you're going to fill out the project charter. You're gonna take a team photo, and then you're going to do a stakeholder analysis to identify who should be on the team. So the team photo obviously comes after this, right? To build your team. And then you're going to do a risk mitigation plan to say, are there any risks to this project that would cause it to fail? Uh, we started a green belt uh, training with another company just several, a few weeks back. And we've probably had, uh, you know, out of 20 projects, we've probably had five that have had to change course because of risks that they identified and they got pulled off onto other things. So we'll do a risk mitigation plan. We'll talk about what metrics we're going to measure that could be leading or lagging in our process. And that's it. That's what you need to fill out for the define phase. Just four simple things, the most important of which is the project charter and the team photo, really. Then we get into the measure phase. You're, in this, you're going to go to the Gemba, do your value stream map, and gather your process data. So here's your data collection form that we showed you earlier. Use this to gather your data. You don't need to put it in, in the report out necessarily. You do need to put the value stream map in the report out. doesn't matter if it's electronic or sticky notes. We personally prefer sticky notes. We think that a picture of your value stream map is a great example. Works fine. As long as you can talk to it and explain it when you report out at the end of your green belt. Okay. Then you're going to show us your process data. Here's the data we collected. Here's how the process is performing before our project was started. Okay. So those are the two main deliverables in the measure phase, the value stream map and the data. Okay. Then you're in the analyze phase. In this phase, you're going to show us the Pareto of your data that you collected, what are the main issues, and from your value stream app. And then you're going to show us your root cause analysis, which is your fishbone and five whys, which we haven't really talked about in detail, but we'll get to those in the next sessions. So those are the key deliverables from the analyze phase. Again, not a lot, pretty simple. And then the data part of the analyze phase is how capable is our process today? We're going to use a statistical tool called process capability to show how you're performing today versus your spec. And then you're done. That's the analyze phase. Pretty straightforward. Then we jump into the improve phase. And the deliverables in this phase are an improvement plan and a future state value stream map. So you'll recognize this from today's training. I have my green sticky notes representing my new process, my blue sticky notes representing action items I need to get that new process in place. And then um, once you've created that, you make a list of the quick wins, improvements, and future improvements you are going to make. This is an improvement plan template we'll go through in the improve phase. And then you're done. Making those improvements and implementing them is the key to the improve phase. It's that simple. And finally, you'll get to the control phase. In the control phase, you're going to be showing us your data before from the measure phase and your data after. Hopefully there's a big shift that says, wow, our project really had a big impact, okay? You're gonna be doing some statistical analysis to prove mathematically that there was an impact to your process. And then of course, the easy stuff is before and after pictures. This is really critical that you remember and, and do this this week if you're starting your project, which you should, take before pictures. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, Ryan hired my 18 year old son to detail his car. I did. And my son willingly went and detailed his car, but he failed to take a before picture of the piles and piles of dirt from Moab that Ryan had accumulated, proudly collected, proudly collected over the years of uh, doing lots of back road, uh, Utah dirt road, great times. Yes, that was a forerunner full of Utah dirt. We probably, uh, you know, an extra 10 pounds. Perhaps. Probably. But without the before picture, all we now have is a very clean, beautiful, pristine forerunner with no evidence of what was there before. We don't even know how big the improvement was because we can't remember what it looked like before. So, Which you wouldn't think would be the case, but we promise, because we've seen this a lot of times, that, that yeah, you think that you remember what it looked like all the times, but there's, there's nothing as powerful as that picture. So take that before picture. Get your current state value stream, your current state uh, spaghetti diagram, all your current state stuff. Have that ready so you can show the before and afters of your project. You know, a, a tree falling in the forest, right? You don't want that to happen. A man does the dishwasher, cleans the does the dishes without his wife to see it. Did it really happen? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. We need the before picture. Okay. Then you're going to have the impact 
um, statement where you, you show, describe what was the impact of this project? What was the effect it had on you, the team, the company? And then finally, you're gonna fill out your control plan, which has mistake proofing, documentation, training, KPIs and follow-up procedures. And this document really shows that your project uh, is not, was not only a good project, but we're actually going to sustain it, okay? Finally, two more things. We have the financial benefit of the project. We will help you with this when we get to this stage, show the dollar value for the improvements. We talked today about eliminating transportation waste, yeah. how to turn that into dollars. You can turn any of the eight wastes into dollars Absolutely. if you know how to do it. Yeah. So we'll show an ROI. And then at the end, there's a survey where we're just gonna go through for the MEP National Network. And we're gonna answer a bunch of questions in the survey about, did this project improve life for our employees? Uh, did it generate new revenue? Did it uh, help us buy new equipment? Did it help us have to not buy new equipment because we made things more efficient? And so all these questions we'll answer at the end of your project. And Ryan and I will help you fill out this questionnaire. Got, a, a, got a question here. Yes. Yes. So how do you suggest getting pictures of fixing data flow issues? Ah, brilliant. So your picture's not necessarily required. Definitely your, your swim lane diagram is required, but for a data flow project, we do screenshots. Yeah. We had one of our clients was a printing company and the printing company's problem was customer intake, the customer order. The customer would call to place an order for a print job. They would email, they would text, they would fill out the electronic form on the website. There was all these different- methods. Lots of variation going on. And so we took pictures of, you know, a customer service rep answering the phone and the email that they would get from a customer. And we'd take a screenshot of what that email looked like and the text that they would send or the form they would fill out. And that picture, we would put some arrows pointing to all the problems like, well, the customer ordered, you know, 500 flyers, but they didn't specify what kind of paper they wanted or if they wanted color or, or black and white. And so we would take screenshots and then just point to all the problems that we saw in those. And that was our before and after picture, right? Before they could call in with an order. And, and the, the result of that project was they always use the online form. There's, you can't submit an order without filling out the online form, which eliminated a ton of variation and defects. Yeah, because however the customer chose to get a hold of the company, there was all sort each each sales rep kind of had their did their own thing. Some would write it on a napkin. Some would they would do everything, everything, and and the culture was that all of that was acceptable. But what it introduced was a lot of variability, and so the the whole the whole concept then was to take all of that variation and say, okay, whatever whatever uh, data we receive in whatever format from the customer internally, we've got to enter it into this system and the system becomes the source of truth. And so it was just, we're just trying to illustrate those different ways so we can tell a story. Remember, this is all about how do we tell the story? And that's what this PowerPoint is. This is your story. At the end of your green belt, you're going to be able to go to your boss, your team, your, your, your spouse and say, this is what I did. This is the improvement that my team made. And it's, it's an awesome story to tell. Okay, now let's say you are in a, if you're in a manufacturing environment, you can do all this on a whiteboard like we did today with sticky notes and, and uh, make this all happen in a physical world. But what if you're in an office environment, you're trying to keep track of this electronically? Or what if you're, uh, you've got a big company with, uh, you know, 10 employees going through Greenbelt training or 20 employees going through Greenbelt training and you want to keep track of, holy cow, I'm overwhelmed. What are all the projects that are going on? Where are they at? What are we going to do? Well, as part of the screen belt training, you have access to a software that will allow you to keep track of that. So we're going to show you how to do that. Um, the software is called KPI Fire. And you can go to the website, just kpifire.com. There's a little bit of a lag between what I'm doing and what everyone else is seeing. And you can see over here on the right hand side is a sign in. Now you should have gotten an email that gave you a login for that um, sometime yesterday or earlier last week. So when you get that email, you click the link in the email and you create a password and that gives you access. So once you, you have created a password, when you click sign in, you'll be able to sign in. It'll take you right into the system. So once you're into the system, you'll notice up top there's a, a menu of things. And likely what you're going to see is just three things, new idea, you're going to see idea funnel and you're going to see projects. 
Now, if you see goals and metrics, that's okay too. That's a, an advanced user license for strategic planning and tracking metrics that most of you don't need. And we, and we typically don't give access to that to green belts. All you need as a green belt are the three menu items of new idea, idea funnel, and projects. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this to capture all of those pink sticky notes. So I click new idea and I have a very simple one line screen that says, what's the idea or the problem? So again, glass, glass half empty, it's a problem. Glass half full, improvement it's an improvement opportunity, an idea for an improvement. So we're gonna go in here, we're gonna say, I think that we have a, a problem where, or an improvement opportunity where we have, you know, 80% yield on line one is causing uh, delays in shipment. Okay, that's a major problem. What pops up when I start filling that in is there's a, an effort impact uh, slider at the bottom. So I can say, well, I think this is going to be a, a medium effort project, but it's going to have a high massive impact. Great. And then the other thing it will ask you is which department is working on this. Now, you probably won't have any departments loaded in your software when you first log in, because most of these are brand new company accounts. But at some point, you can load all your departments and say, this is a project that's going to be in the production. It's going to be in the purchasing team, uh, warehouse team, you know, any of your departments you can put in the software and then you can drop this idea into that department's idea funnel. So for me, I'm going to put this into the North American operations idea funnel and I'm going to hit enter. And it's going to take me to the idea funnel screen. The idea funnel screen is where I keep track of all the ideas or problems that my team has run into lately that we want to maybe work on as projects. Now you'll see in the top left, there's an effort impact matrix. I can see green at the top right, red at the bottom left. The green means low effort, high impact projects. The bottom right where it's red is high effort, low impact projects. So you obviously wanna work on the green ones first, right? So I can look at that list and I can actually see how many ideas for projects have been submitted month by month on the screen. And then below that, there's a data table. And you can see right at the top of that data table is my new idea. There's a problem where we have 80% yield on line one causing delays in shipment. And I know what department it's in. I know who created it. It was Chuck Norris. That's me, of course. Chuck. Absolutely. Call me Chuck. I'm basically Chuck Norris. Essentially. <laughs> Could happen. Is it a corrective action from the customer? Yes or no. So you can flag that there. What date was it submitted? And then we can look at the effort and impact and we can prioritize this. So what we do is once a week, my team gets together. We look at our idea funnel electronically because you know maybe we're all in different locations and we prioritize. We say, well, is this gonna be a high priority or a low priority, high, medium or low? And I can prioritize this and say, you know, this is a very high priority. But I put that in, it's going to prompt me to say, do you wanna send an email to the person that submitted this idea to say that the priority has been assigned and that their project is going to get started? So you can send that, I'm not going to right now. And then you can see the status of this idea is it's still an idea. But once we start it, we can make it active by just clicking active and activate that idea. So that's it. This is your idea funnel. All the ideas that you could work on as a team. Now, you probably don't have time to work on every idea that pops up. So that's what the idea funnel is for, is to keep a list so you don't lose track. But now let's say this is our number one priority. We are going to start working on this. What are we going to do? We say idea and we change it to active and it's going to ask me what workflow do I want to use for this and for that you're going to select demaic because we want to do this as a demaic project now there's lots of other workflows there but you can select demaic click looks good and you're on your way so now the software is going to take all the steps from the demaic process and all the tools that you need and it's going to suck it into your project and create this beautiful project where you can get to work. So idea has been activated and we have the series of steps of the DMAIC. So you see define, measure, analyze, improve, and control are all there. If I open up my define phase, I have a nice task list here. The first task is define the problem statement. The next task is establish a SMART goal. Third task, select a project leader who's gonna lead this team. 
Fourth task is select a project champion, an executive sponsor who's going to sponsor this project. Number five, find team members and subject matter experts, okay? Next step, voice of the process. Do I have any existing data like value stream maps or sidebox from previous work that I can use for this project? Next step, voice of the business. Which KPI is going to improve and how does that tie into the metrics for my company? Right, so which business, what's the business case for this project? And the next one, voice of the customer. Who's my customer for this project? How am I going, how's, what requirements do they have for this project? How's it going to work, okay? So I'm going down this list step by step. And as I'm filling it out, I can do one of two things. I can put the information here in the notes area and the notes area a lot of times will have notes on how to do this step. So it has instructions built into it. So if you forgot how to do a stakeholder analysis, it'll tell you how to do a stakeholder analysis. So I can take my notes there, I can attach files, and then I can mark this, this task as done when I'm done with it. So I go to do, doing, done, to do, doing, done. And I'm just working my way down this list. And remember what Ryan told you earlier, if you get to a step where you're like, oh, this doesn't make sense for my project, great. You can just mark it as done, or you can even go over here and just click on the three dots and click delete task, okay? Piece of cake, easy to do. Um, and most of the things in the define phase are what? They're filling out the project charter because that's our main deliverable. So built into KPI Fire, you can see on the top over on the left, there is a tab for charter. This is your project charter. Now it looks a little bit different than it does in the PowerPoint presentation, but you've got the same fields. What's the problem statement? What's the smart goal right here? What waste do we think we're going to eliminate with this project? And then what's in and out of scope of this project? What process are we going to work on? Which processes are we not going to work on? And then as you go through the measure and analyze phase, you can come back to your charter and fill in things like your root cause analysis, right? You can put that right here inside the software. So it keeps track of everything to do with your project. But really all you need to get the define phase does is put in the problem statement, the SMART goal, and then come down here to your key dates and select a target completion date for this project. In this case, we want our Greenbelt projects to be completed by the end of June. So Friday, June 25th, you're going to put that in as your completion date and you're locked in, you're ready to go. Okay. So now I love that prior screen because every time you checked uh, one of those off, Chuck Norris all of a sudden appeared. So he did appear. It was me. it was like the Chuck Norris is killing the screen. It really is. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. So if you want to upload a picture over for yourself, you go up here to the top right and you go to your profile and that's where you can upload your picture of Chuck Norris or your other favorite celebrity. Um, so you can update your file there. What's really cool about this is now, as you can see, when I get done with my define phase, as I go through and check these boxes, you can feel confident that you're following the Lean Six Sigma program. You can be confident that you're, when you get done with the define phase, you did what you were supposed to do. And even though there's a lot of check boxes here, um, how many are there? It says 17, there's 17 check boxes. Most of them are things you're already doing. Like I'm, you know, I'm definitely going to have a problem statement. I'm definitely going to, you know, move on with the, the next step. So you fill them all out. It keeps track of your progress. And then you can see, okay, I am, you know, so was that say 76% through my defined phase, I'm almost done. And then once I'm done with that, you move on to the measure phase and you go on from there. Now, what, let's say you forgot to have a tool. You're like, where's the value stream map? I need to do a value stream map. Well, you go down to your measure phase and you say, oh, this step says create a value stream map. See attached. I can go to the attachment icon and right there, I see a measurement plan in place, and I can go and pull that up to create my measurement plan. If I want to create a value stream map in this step, I can go here and I can click on that link, and it'll take me to an Excel template where I can create my value stream map. So again, if you want to do it electronically, the tools are here in the system, so you can do all of them electronically. We don't recommend that. We recommend that you do your value stream map with your team on a whiteboard. And you can take a picture of it and just upload the file. Yes. So if you want your value stream map to be seen by everybody, you go here, you click upload file, and you upload your picture of your value stream map. Okay. Very simple. Very, very simple. 
So why does this help you? Well, number one, it helps you if you're trying to keep track of a bunch of projects throughout the year. As you guys adopt a culture of continuous improvement, you're going to have dozens of projects. How are you going to keep track of which ones you completed, how, who did them, what departments did them? You're going to need some way of keeping track of that. The other great thing you're going to use it for is capturing employee ideas. You can download the KPI Fire app on your phone. So when you're on a gimbal walk and you see, oh, there's a, a cable there and it's a tripping hazard, pull it up in your app, type in tripping hazard in factory one, hit enter, and immediately you've logged that tripping hazard to that factory so that anyone can do it. So you can see there's the KPI Fire app. It logs me in. Once I'm logged in, the very first screen is an idea entry screen. I simply type in my idea. I can snap a photo of the problem I'm seeing. I hit submit and that photo and that idea is boom, it's dropped into the idea funnel for that factory. And then all the factory manager has to do is go up, open their idea funnel right here. They see the idea has been entered. They click on it and they can close it right then. They say, I moved the tripping hazard. I fixed the problem, done. And you just did a little mini Kaizen event. So this keeps track of all your Kaizen events, big or small, electronically, if you don't happen to have paper with you or you, know, you don't have paper on your floor or whatever like that. It's very simple. Okay, so new ideas, go to the idea funnel, turn into projects. What if I wanna see all the projects going on in my company? I have a couple of reports. So I have a list, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a list view, which lists all of my projects. And I can see red, yellow, green, is the project healthy? Is it on schedule? Now we recommend doing Greenbelt projects in two months or less. If it's gonna take more than two months, what happens? Uh, nothing, that's the problem. Yeah, if, if you drag it on for more than two months, it's, you're just gonna lose traction. It'll never get done. Now we also want you to do a little mini Kaizen events that can be done in a week. And those Kaizen events are great because they have big improvements and you can keep track of them really easily and know, are they done? So you should have projects here. If you see a project that you started and it's red, meaning it's behind schedule, you might ask the team, you know, are we still doing this or is this something we should maybe cancel because we're just, we're not getting around to it. So if we're not getting it done. Let's take it off our list. And you don't have to, you know, delete it. You can put it in the idea funnel, you know, go back to the status of the project, change it back to an idea. And that way, maybe you'll get to it next month or the month after that. So if it's an important idea, keep it, but just don't put it in your active projects list. Okay. Question. Question, yes. Question. Um, how much is the program? Oh, how much does it cost? So it's free for you for the next six months as you do Greenbelt projects. Um, after that, uh, it just depends on the size of the company and how many people you want to have on the system, right? So we're talking anywhere for most companies, small companies, a, a couple thousand a year, all the way up to we have, you know, billion dollar multinational companies on the system that, uh, you know, it, it's expensive for them, but relatively speaking. <laughs> right, we're just trying to help you you know, especially since there's a number of projects happening within one company, this is just a way to collect all that and get the visibility on it. So yeah. we at least wanted uh, so that you can see and, and because of all the memory joggers that are built into it, it also helps you flow through the through the uh, uh, projects. Yeah, exactly. So you've got six months uh, of use of it for free. If it's valuable to you, um, you can purchase it. If it's not, that's OK, too. You can, we've seen companies try to keep track of this in spreadsheets and other ways and, uh, you know, try to find easier solutions with paper or something like that. But, uh, yeah. uh, you know, if you like the idea of being able to follow a structured approach and having it guide new employees through, uh, this works really well. So I'll show you just a couple more things. So there's a couple of reports in here. You can see um, this is my project. So this is a my projects page shows me everything that I'm working on. So I can click really quickly through and see every project I'm working on, fill out the project charter for it. And then what's really cool is there's a status report tab. In the status report tab, you can go in here and every time you work on the Kaizen or do anything to improve it, you can type in the results here, hit send, and it will blast a little email out to everybody on the team or who you specify in the list to say, here's a quick update on the project. Here's where we're at. We just finished the define phase. And now we're uh, moving on to the measure phase. You can send a quick note out to everybody, let them know where they're at. And they can read the status report from their email and then click on the link if they want and it will take them right into the project so they can look at all the good work that you've been doing, which is really cool, okay? And a couple of reports that you can look at here. 
um, if we want to see how much benefit we're getting out of this, we can look at a project benefit report. A lot of companies when they do Lean Six Sigma will set dollar targets for the savings for, from their Lean Six Sigma project. So a lot of companies will say, look, we spent you know, three, $4,000 sending people to a training. Now we want to get $20,000 return on investment. How do we measure that? Well, in the system, we'll put the target in for what we want to measure as the result, and then we can track how well we're progressing. So companies, we have companies that have, you know, multi-million dollar savings as a target every year. Um, you know, OC Tanner, which is a local company here in Utah, they'll set a, a goal to achieve a massive improvement in savings in their company. And then they use that money to help pay for things like raises and equipment improvements and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Great example about just how to quantify everything that we're talking about here so that you can, again, it's all about telling the story. We want to tell the story about what's happening and turn it into real dollars so that we can see the dollars that we're saving. We've got a question here that, that's asking about, is the system capable of making, uh, of sending out emails uh, about uh, action items and due dates? Absolutely. Yeah, you bet. So you'll see uh, there's a notifications and alerts up here. This will notify you if you have anything later or uh, that's, that's coming due. And then uh, we also have uh, on the daily update page, on the far right, the page you land on actually when you log in is typically this daily update page unless you change it. And that daily update page, what it does is it sends, it, it actually summarizes everything that you need to do or that anyone else needs to do on your project. So you can see- Gotta say, Chuck's pretty busy here. Under tasks, we have new tasks assigned to you tasks that are due this week, tasks that are past due. And I can see I have a bunch of tasks past due. If I've done them, I can just mark it was done right there in the screen. And then approvals, KPI Fire has the ability to approve phases. So if you get to the end of the define phase and you wanna approve that before you move on to the measure phase, you can have KPI Fire send approvals to the manager who then has to approve it and say, yes, your project charter looks good, move on. You know, if you're using the software for research and development, you could say, yes, you've completed the project research. Now it's time to go prototype. So you can use approvals and the system will notify you of any pending approvals that you have to mark as done. Okay. And then status reports. This will show you any projects that you haven't sent a status report update on recently. And you can click on that project and jump in and go immediately to send a status report. And so all of this is designed to keep you in the loop as far as what are you behind on, what are you ahead on, and uh, you know, are you keeping the rest of the people in your company informed? Great question. Sweet. Awesome. And we don't have time, obviously, today to go through all the capability. We're just trying to show you a little bit. Uh, when we do one-on-ones with you guys, we will help you get your project set up both in the PowerPoint presentation and in the software so that you can keep track of both, right? And that, that will help Ryan and I when we... Uh, want to see where your project's at, if we can just log in and look at your project and know that you've completed the defined phase checklist, that's going to help Ryan and I know, oh, they're on track with where they should be right now. So after this training today, Ryan and I are going to be scheduling one-on-ones with some teams uh, to get you guys off to the races. So we'll send out availability on our calendar. You'll see that show up in your email and then just click on that to uh, schedule a half hour appointment with Ryan or I to make sure your project is getting started. Okay. So that's going to happen in the next week. Okay. So that is, uh, well, let me show you one more report that's actually really cool that I think you'll like called the Project Accountability Report. This shows you all of the different departments, which projects they're working on, and the total amount of dollars that each department has saved from continuous improvement efforts. Okay, so that's a cool report. And then we have the, uh, which one is the other one I'm looking for? Oh, the team engagement report. This one's great. This will tell you if you're managing continuous improvement in a big organization, you can see how many people are submitting ideas for projects. What's the average value of a project? What's our target for savings this year? And how many actual savings have we achieved this year? And then you can scroll down and you can see all of the projects from all the departments, how many projects they've done, how many ideas they've submitted, and how much savings they've generated from those projects throughout the year. This is really cool because we have companies that every year generate millions of dollars worth of savings and they can show directly which projects contributed to that. And they reward their employees for it. They, they, you know, they get bonuses and, and cool things for people that do projects, which is, which is a lot of fun. Love it. Question. 
Um, if a person on your team updates the project, does it change on your account? If I save a picture, will attach to the team's account? Yes. So your uh, project is like a shared environment where you have lots of team members that join. So if I go back to my projects, click on my fishnet cleaning project, you guys think that's a joke, that that's not a real project, but it actually is. Very true. Fish are very handy. We had a, a fishing company that was out dropping nets in the ocean, and one of their problems was they had to constantly pull the nets up and clean them. So we worked on a project to help them clean the nets faster so they could get the nets in the water faster so they could catch more fish. And so you can see Chuck Norris is on the project, Keith's on the project. If I want to add more team members, I can type in a name here like Abe Lincoln or Albert Einstein. And uh, I can add them it's as very a team eclectic member. team. I've got a great team. That is a great team. Absolutely. Now, before you can add them as a team member, you have to add them to the system. So if they're not, if they if you type their name and they're not in KPI Fire, you have to go over here and invite them as a user. So you have to invite them to join KPI Fire, put them in the system, and then you can add them to your team. Uh, but once you put them in their team, you guys can edit the tasks, edit the project charter, upload files. Um, you know, you can collaborate. Everything to do with continuous improvement, you basically would have one location for. Okay, great. So that's the uh, software. Here's next steps. And I'm going to type it on a slide just so that we all have it in front of us. So next steps. We are going to uh, sign up for a half hour meeting with Cedro or Ryan. Okay. We are going to start the DMAIC process. So you're going to get through the define phase or value stream map to identify problems or a project. If I could type, that'd be great. And then you're going to start the measure phase, okay? And then before the next training, what do you need to have? We want you to log in to KPI Fire. We want you to get a laptop or computer ready. And then have Excel on the computer. Okay. So by this time next week, we're going to be doing some more data crunching. The next two sessions are going to be a lot of data crunching, hands-on on the laptops and the computers. So you're going to need to have those handy and ready to go um, for that. We're going to be looking at the looking at your projects in KPI Fire and then do data crunching using Excel and then a statistical software that we'll uh, introduce you to uh, next week. So that's what we need to have ready. Anything that I missed? No, I think that's it. Just <clears throat> we'll we'll walk you through each one of those step by step. So we'll take the time in the session to do all those. So just you know, get ready. The most important thing is making sure that you've got the project, you know, you know, which direction you're going to go. And then we've got some concrete things we can work on. Yeah, so by this time next week, you should have your project charter filled out and all the steps of the defined phase done by this time next week. Okay. And if you can get into the measure phase, go to the Gemma, do your value stream map with your team, get start gathering some data. That's great as well. You can, you can get through the measure phase. So go as fast as you, as you want. And as you can, but uh, definitely by this time next week, you've got to have your defined phase done. Uh, and again, you can use the checklist in the slides, or you can go to KPI Fire and use the checklist inside KPI Fire as well. So, any other questions? Is it required we use KPI Fire for the project? Um, no, you don't have to use KPI Fire, it's there to help you. Um, if you don't put your project in KPI Fire, uh, Ryan and I just need a way to see, have access to what you've done. So you're gonna need to keep that checklist somewhere. So if you don't use KPI Fire, what you will have to do is go into uh, the checklist in the define phase of the project, for example. Um, see if I can find it here. Yeah, basically, basically we're right just, it's a communication tool. We're just working on a communication tool. So if you use KPI Fire, great. If not, just work through this checklist. Yeah, go through this checklist and uh, make sure that you've got check marks on everything. So when Ryan and I get on the half hour meeting, that time goes really quick. We want to see where you're at uh, in the checklist. And then we want to see uh, any work that you've done. And then 
discuss problems or barriers that we can help you remove. And again, if it's not applicable, just put not applicable. Yep, exactly. Any other questions? Okay. Great. If not, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Good luck. Look for some emails from us and we will uh, see you next week.